twice as many there as the meeting we went to before. Right, yeah. So words are getting around yeah. this is getting to be a serious topic, huh? And there was a lot of back and forth questions and and uh, some answers. But it, it was a good meeting. Uh, there was nothing uh, slack about the meeting at all. But uh, and then <coughs> I went to Housing Solutions, and they're making a major change in what they, uh, I'm not sure what they call it, but it was a repair uh, program that uh, if somebody couldn't afford to get a roof fix, for example, they will come in and, and fix the roof on a low interest loan. Uh, type situation and up to this point they've been uh, they've had a, a, a woman that does uh, takes care of the paperwork and they've had an uh, ex-contractor that did the inspections and what have you to make sure they're going to they're going to do away with the ex-contractor as an inspector and actually he's going to go back and be a contractor to try and do some of the work so but one of the problems that they're having uh, is finding contractors to do the work uh, it was interesting uh, uh, what's the gal's name that's the county commissioner in Julie Geibel? no, no in, in La Plata County when Gwen, Gwen said that uh, they had put out bids for a seven hundred thousand dollar project, building project for their road department, and they got one bid. And things are the, the complaint all the way, out, way around the county commissioner from San Juan County said they can't even get anybody to bid on building a low income housing. Hmm. Project. They've got the money to do it, but they can't get anybody to bid on the project. Wow. They won't even bid on it. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, anyone needing those home repair projects, if you know somebody, uh, have them get in touch with the housing solutions. At this point, this last year, half of the projects that they did were in Montezuma County. So. Mm -hmm. And they've got a, when they first got into the business, housing solutions, they built a building in Dove Creek that was going to be used for low income housing. It's since become a, a day school for a little old kindergarten, I think. And the people who are running that now have asked to purchase that building, and they've agreed on a price now to do that. So that building, will, they call it the Dove's Nest. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna, they're gonna be able to buy it. <coughs> so I think that's all I have. Right. Well, just real quickly, I attended the basic um, muscles um, in that. That meeting was held at the uh, Destination Grill on Wednesday night. And thanks for, for reminding me, Commissioner. And, uh, James Dietrich did a fantastic job of uh, representing the county, showing pictures and some ideas that the county has to reopen this ancient area. I got to tell you, it was a very confrontational meeting. Um, There's a couple of gentlemen there that were um, uh, very vocal. Uh, and uh, well, I know our reporters were there, but uh, <coughs> I guess I would would like to. Make it, I didn't feel it was my place to make a comment because it wasn't um, the our meeting running. But um, one of the gentlemen was extremely upset that when he went out to um, Sage Hen 
um, hunting that he's seen a bicycle. And my response is, is if our forest is two million acres, <coughs> and if we just take an educated guess that there might be 50,000 acres in the San Juan forest, that would leave 1,950,000 acres where you could go hunting without seeing a bicycle. So maybe um, if you've lived here all your life, you should, uh, if you don't want to see a bicycle, don't go to a bicycle trail hunting. Um, that's all I had to report. And with that, we will go on to our accounts payable. Did you already do your lift Yes. We don't mess around here. Accounts <laughs> payable for the month of October. Um, busy month. Um, general fund. Whoops. Nine twenty three twenty. that out. There were two items that were outstanding. Uh, if you want me to, I'll give you a report on the uh, courthouse, too. Yes, there were those sure. three, three areas, those three units that they wanted to have access to, that they needed to have a platform and lights so that they could be worked on. That was completed this weekend. Nice. And the, um, where they're redoing the concrete down on the north side of Park Street, um, Ken Torres is supposed to go review. It's laid out to be poured today. And once they get his review today, um, then they'll pour that concrete. And those should be the last two items to get our certificate of occupancy. That would be great. So um, as soon as that's poured and everything's, uh, Monty will get in touch with Sam Proper and um, have get that certificate get of that, occupancy. Get that final, uh, final certificate. And so with that being said, um, the... Do, do, do we know how they had to split up that uh, re, uh, reworking of those access entries and stuff? Who paid for that? I do not know. I, know. I will ask the question and make sure <coughs> I'm, I'm holding a check to Humphreys Poli and to um, Colorado James to make sure that it doesn't come through on mm -hmm. our bill. Good. So... Um, from what I understand, it was probably going to be split between Colorado James and the HVAC, the HVAC um, M E N E, mm -hmm. I think is who um, was the contractor that did that. So mm -hmm. I'll clarify that. But things are we're almost almost there. So I'll move that the October accounts payable be approved. Second. Motion second to approve the Montezuma County accounts payable for the month of October 2017. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
All right, we'll go on to the financial statement. In our financial <coughs> statements for the month of October, um, grand total assets, 42 million, 58, uh, 58,000. 68. 68. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm a long way from that. Yeah, you are. You're a long way off those little numbers. <coughs> Have you heard when he's going to do that? Because I don't. We're wasting sunshine. I, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was going to be this week because he, he was there not last week but the week before. So I uh, he's been in contact with Mike. So our capital, we shouldn't have too many more expenses in our capital. One of the things that we had potential was um, the fairgrounds here. I think that was for a dozer and didn't they trade with no you mean a blade, blade. A blade. Yeah. and I don't know did you get a new blade this year or well, did that, that was part of that part of, part of that so that's been taken care of they received that through the renewal that you took it. what their old one and traded it in Rob well, they, they did that but they bought the, one of my blades at the fair market value yeah. and then we got a new blade to replace that one okay. So I think, and then there was a, a potential for a roof, roof replacement on that half of the building. At this point, we haven't had any issues, so, yeah, so we haven't really spent spend that money. Good. So that money will most likely roll over into the um, remodel for next year. And last, least, 
administration fund as the ETA Lodgers Conservation Trust and eighteen point one percent. Compared to 102 here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, it's kind of one of those stories. One of the things that happens with it at the end of the year is the transfer from the LEA for all the Yeah, that's 800 and some odd. <coughs> that's a big, and that always, we don't know what that number is until we estimate right at the end of December after they uh, paid the bills and then we look at so it's hey, eight and nine years. If we only have that, that at least should be paid off next year. That is correct. February 2nd, we own 18 vehicles. Two of which is in total. Total, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's <coughs> yeah. Who's 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 approved second motion second to approve the October 2017 financial statements for Montezuma County all those in favor aye aye all right at this time we have public comment if somebody would like to comment to the uh, commissioners if you come up to the podium state your name and address <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gail Epoch, 7672 County Road, CC, Pleasant View. Um, <clears throat> I have two items. Um, first one, I went to the uh, Sheriff's uh, uh, Crime Stats 101 last week. Extremely interesting. I, I believe that Commissioner Lambert has attended that. I would encourage uh, Commissioner Sucre <coughs> and Hotel to also attend it. The, the last one is going to be November 29th at the Lewis Ariola Fire Department. Um, we don't like to admit um, that our crime's going up, uh, but uh, the stats say they are, uh, and it's, it's good to know what's going on out there. So I hope you can make it. The second item I had, um, Commissioner Lambert did um, make a uh, reference to this. Um, I attended the uh, Empire Electric's board meeting, um, well, the last one, a week or two ago. And uh, what they're saying is that uh, the Totten Lake solar farm is uh, in real jeopardy because um, the International <coughs> Trade uh, Commission is considering putting a 35% tariff on uh, imports of solar panels from uh, China. And if they do, um, the Totten Lake solar farm will not pencil out. It simply will not be uh, economically feasible, feasible to build that. Now, apparently the recommendation from the Trade Commission went to the President last week sometime, and I don't know if he has signed that or not, uh, but um, to sign it would fit within what his campaign promises were because he was trying to bring uh, manufacturing jobs back to the United States rather than having imports. So um, Totten Lake Solar Farm is is in jeopardy. Um, don't know what we can do about it, uh, but it may not happen. So sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Ellen Foster, County Road T. Dolores. Um, I just want to piggyback on Gayla's comments about the solar farm at Empire Electric. Um, I really support that effort, and I think a lot of I know a lot of people who also do. And um, she just said she didn't know what we could do about it, but maybe this would be an opportunity for the county commissioners to write a letter in opposition to uh, tariffs on Chinese produced solar panels um, to our Congress people. I guess I would follow up with Gayla. Gayla, you said that it will put an end to their solar farm. Will, will it be an end or will it be a delay until 
maybe American manufacturing of solar panels can catch up if, if, if the Chinese are are put in a posture where they have to, we're, we're not seeing near as many imports of their solar panels. Will that incentivize American producers of solar panels to then step up their productivity? So maybe it won't be an end to that solar project, maybe it will be a delay. But uh, <coughs> the Empire flatly states that if they don't get the Chinese solar panels in here, that it will be a that would be a death knell for that solar farm. They, they didn't say uh, it was uh, a death knell. Uh, it doesn't pencil out. If American-made solar panel prices drop enough to be down there where the Chinese solar panel costs are now, then once again it will pencil out and it will go forward. Um, but I'm not predicting that will happen. Perhaps it will, but... Uh, if if they could produce them in the United States for the price that China is producing them, um, you think they already would be? I don't know. Well, and one other thing to consider is that tax credits for um, installing solar are expiring, and maybe that's something that figures into Empire's um, Budget Why does process. Empire, like, <coughs> hurry up and buy the solar panels? There are, they've already been spoken for, and people are actually hoarding solar panels. I've been involved in the solar barn raising group um, with John Lyle from Durango, and we would like to put solar panels out on our place. But he can't even order them anymore because they're they're spoken for like a year in advance already. Mm. So by the time he can even get them, and I can get them on my place, the tax credits will probably have expired. So. <coughs> Anybody else like to comment to the commissioners? All right, seeing none, we will go to our Road Department weekly report with Rob A. Hart, <coughs> Marzami County Road Supervisor. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. How are you? Good. 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 Can I take care of a housekeeping thing real quick? Sure. Um, next week, you're all leaving for the CCI conference, and Rob's going to, correct? Yep. Um, I will not be here to leave, so whomever, I'll give the keys to the Suburban to whomever we'll wants them. We'll I'll need get, a ride home, but I don't need a ride up. We'll need to get those by about Friday, then we'll be well, we'll, early Monday morning. And actually, I'll probably just give them to you today, just so you guys know. And I don't know what time you guys are on leave. I don't have to make right. the drive, so I'll let the four of you decide. Right. I, I think we have like, stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. I think it starts at 2. I think it's yeah, on the first. Look, I think we need to be there by 2 o'clock, and it's about a six and a half, seven hour drive, so. We're usually at 6, six and o'clock. The boys have left at 6 and done pretty well. I'm actually going to be there, and I'm going to attend a administrator's conference starting at 8 on Monday, so. I'm going to leave at 6 o'clock here. That's fine yeah. with me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How's it done? There's just be the four of us going up. The four of you, and then five, five of us coming back. Coming back. Mm -hmm. I got it. And all my bags and all my shopping. Oh, no. sorry. <laughs> Make sure you bring a roof container for that suburban <laughs> Okay, yeah. got what it. What happened to Greyhound? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Hmm. We'll pick you up in Durango. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, it's not you, it's all, your, it's all your baggage. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have plenty of room for you. Yeah. I'll send it home with my husband. <laughs> Okay, on the schedule, it's um, sh shooting target lots of times on these schedules, but this week, particularly with uh, Thanksgiving coming up, it's kind of like, wow. So bear with me a little bit. Some things have changed since we did this Thursday, but uh, basically Road P culvert is going in today just like we said it would. This is that one big one in the Cortez District that we had to put a retaining wall type effect to it over there just east of Road 25 down in that draw. So they're doing that this morning. So that's right on track. But the other item that we've been doing with three districts, Cortez, Mancus, and Dolores, is doing a lot of blading. And we started up at the Summit Ridge area and worked the Dolores district and worked our way down off the hill and 
into the Cortez district last week and got a lot of those roads cleaned up. Tomorrow we'll go back to blading after this culvert's done and go back on into south of Cortez, back around towards Lewis, Yellow Areola, right on out to Pleasant View. So if anybody out there in TV land is listening, we're coming. You know, we're, we're on our way. We're just, with the holidays and moving people around and shifting people around, it's just taking a little longer. But we are low on water. We have only limited resources now with all the irrigation systems being shut down, and we're having to haul lots of water. So it just takes us a little longer now than it normally would if we had different lakes and places to get water that we used to get. So, But we're, we're working out <coughs> the bugs, can and we're working out of Totten Lake. Yes, if the trouble with Lock Totten right now is just down now. It's so low. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's hard to pull up there. there. And I haven't requested a, uh, access into the lake itself, and I might be able to do that now that the muscle season's kind of over. Uh, they might work with me, but I'd have to ask. But uh, we're still getting a lot of the water out of the draws in different places, but it's just further to haul. You know, it just takes yeah. more trucks and more effort. And with vacations and a holiday, people being gone, we're just limited on resources right now. So. Are you still able to get water from those? Ponds there west of Plenty. Yes, sir. Yeah, and we'll be good out there. And once we get back into that area, that'll be a major resource of water for us right there. Yeah, that's still good. But it's those in betweens, you know. Like, yeah. Oh boy, <laughs> grab another truck, you know, and, and we're out of people and we're out of trucks, and so it's just taking a little longer. But need some moisture. And need some rain, yeah, absolutely. So. How many water trucks do you have? We have uh, we had eight, but one broke down with tank wore out on it, so we're down to seven now. So. They're <coughs> they're uh, hauling water from. Uh, Oliver's mm -hmm. pond to the oil or the CO2 drilling. We got access to that one you too. Got access yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's only in this area down here that we have so much trouble coming off the of Summit Ridge. We're pretty good there. We're able to get water out of the Upper Dolores, and then once we broke down off the hill and come down towards Cortez, we run out of water only because there's no irrigation going on. And so there's no water in these little draws that we're able to get out of, which is what may happen next year if this. Yeah. Well, if we don't get this solved, you know, and I think Kinder, I mean, uh, MVI is working, still talking to some of the board of directors. They're still working towards a resolution on that uh, water law that says we'll be able to get water, but there's no answer on that yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, did you get your access station down there on the pipeline below the fairgrounds? Did you get that? We've got everything in order except for the Bureau of Reclamation has not gave us the official easement access right away. They tell us they're going to. We've gave them all the maps and all the ideas we've gotten. It's just a formality. Uh, MVI is certainly behind us on tapping into that system. Uh, again, that'll happen probably after Thanksgiving. We'll get a backhoe out there and put that valve in and get that put in. Um, but the final say will be the Bureau of Reclamation and their, their easement, or allowing us an easement in there to park, which they say is no issue. It's just yeah. to get the paperwork That's done. That's still so. not going to help you at this time of irrigation year. season. Yeah, no. <coughs> yeah, so. But, you know, in reality, we did a lot of roads last week. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just takes more time. It used to be we could run three districts in three different places, and now we take more people out of all districts to run the whole operation. And yeah. we just set a path and said, let's go this direction, and we'll end up out at your district out there where you live last, you know. So, well, yeah, I'm coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know one of her roads is one of the worst, so. Bob, did you say that with the purchase of those uh, CDOT snow blades, that's going to free you up with a couple of your older older trucks that you might turn them into water haulers? No, I said right. that'd be a spare parts to get the old ones running oh, again, okay. so, yeah. yeah. I thought maybe you were going to pick up another couple of water trucks. Oh, uh, water trucks are not the issue, it's the tanks. The, the tanks, tanks are expensive yeah. and you have to get them built special, and so then, you, we, you know, it's it's just a matter of do we take some of our old trucks. If we get into buying semis for hauling gravel, the belly dumps, then that's going to give us either two options, either trade in the old trucks for down payments on the new ones or keep the old trucks as water trucks mm -hmm. and start putting tanks on them and upgrading that fleet because we have a lot of old water trucks. They're good water trucks, yeah. but they're getting some miles on them now. So. But we've increased water trucks uh, three since I've been here. Yeah. So we had five, now we had eight, and we had a tank wear out, and those are expensive. You have to have them special built, and it's just a process. Can I ask you, um, in the process of the <coughs> I know that their annual meeting, I can't this, this is January. January. Um, do we need to have John do a proposal, or is, do we need to wait until we see what comes up? Because if, do we need to have a proposal that we go in front of the board to vote? I feel like that might help if we front end it. I mean, I don't know. Has their attorney you? contacted you, other than that one letter? Uh, we spoke by phone, okay. uh, maybe once or twice, but um, 
it was all I don't know they, they, nothing solid because that's a bylaw issue with MBI isn't it it's not a water state water right or well it used to be Keenan but I'm you know talking to some of the board with a particular board member it's not even that anymore now it's a uh, you know, there was a thought once that somebody could step up with a lot of water shares at the annual meeting and propose that we change the bylaws. Mm -hmm. But even the bylaws, if, from what I understand, and it gets gray for me, but even that won't work now because it's a water usage issue, oh, legal yeah, issue. Yeah, it's for taking ag water and using it for a, yes. a different, different application. Yeah. But you talked about an M&I. <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah, this year that, that was an option, and the looks like the way they're kind of looking at it now, which is I'm hoping their attorney will talk to John a little, a little bit about it, but possibly using, how do they say this? I don't say it wrong. Using DWCD water that they allow us to use and have MVI carry it for us in their canals. And that takes some legal jargoning to make that happen. And by doing that, then we could use that water because they allow us to use that water for M and I reasons, mm -hmm. but we need a vehicle to carry it or a means to carry it, which is an MBI, right? Which is an MBI issue, and then that's all where the attorneys step in and work out the details, and that's about as gray as I can make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. But regardless, we have to do something before that meeting, otherwise. I, I don't know that that's true anymore, Larry Don, because I don't know that that issue, that what we talked about all summer, it doesn't really play out now with the water laws. The water laws say you cannot use MBI water for anything but agriculture, period. So we would then use DWCD water, which they allow us to, with MBI's canals. And that takes a co An agreement commitment there. between the two to let us do that, and that's where the legal part comes in. So. Yeah, for them to be the carriage vehicle right. of the water. And that was the way it was explained to me in a very rude, rudimentary way. Yeah. The best we could get figured out leaning on a side roll. Yeah. So. so how do we pursue that? I'll bug that guy again. I don't Larry. know, Larry Don. It's a good question, and I asked the same question. So do we need to do anything? What can we do to help facilitate it? And uh, the guy says, just hang on. We're working on it. So. Uh, it's the best answer I could get. So, I, I, I don't think it'll hurt if I recontact their attorney. I don't know. I don't think it will that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But to go to the annual board meeting, like we kind of hoped at one time, you might find out true or not true. I don't know that that's the real answer anymore. It's changed so much with the water laws, you know. So, so in the meantime, we're blading roads, and we'll blade through. Well, Wednesday morning we have a four-hour shift. Wednesday morning we'll do some work on it, and then. Come back after Thanksgiving on the 27th, and that's when we start getting back into uh, graveling different roads and doing different things and doing other items. But grab, we do want to blade these roads. We want to try and get them smoothed up as good as we can before it snows, if it snows, and when it snows. And uh, it'll come. And they're doing a great job. The roads are actually holding well. Once we get them set back down, they're doing very well. So we're moving along. Uh, the Roundup District is uh, the one district that I'm leaving them alone to keep doing some of the things they're doing, and that's... Uh, uh, Road W, we got that done last week. Uh, we got that long section there that uh, west of Air, west of Lewis built up. Uh, we're going to go back out next week and put some uh, three quarter inch road base on Road 13. That kind of turned a little bit coarser than we would like for running through the winter, especially the dry winter. So we're going to go ahead and get some hay camp gravel and put some oh, about three inches on that throughout the winter and let that set in. Then we'll worry about more on it next summer if we need to. Uh, we want to work on Road S there, uh, west of Road 20 or east of Road 24, where we ground that out. We want to put some fabric in there. I mean, this dry weather is really, from a construction standpoint, is good. Yeah, yeah, it's it's helping us catch a lot of these things, so we'll be ready to go earlier next year with our chip seal program. So there's a benefit to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a downside, but there's always a benefit. <coughs> um, we're going to expand the Pleasant View yard. We moved some material around. We've ordered some uh, poly pipe uh, we want to put in there since it'll be there forever. Uh, we didn't think putting metal culvert in that drainage would be a good idea, being that we don't want to dig it up again someday. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put poly pipe in there, moving along with that and get that done. We're hauling some uh, three quarter inch gravel out of Ormston down there, stockpiling it for winter. Uh, soft spots, we'll put some at the Roundup and at Cortez too. And just have some of that good clean gravel to fix muddy spots this winter if it comes up. So that's basically what the trucks are doing. Uh, crushing is continued through uh, the end of the month through hay camp. As long as the weather's good and we're, we can crush it reasonably well, we're going to stick right with it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, women Ooch should be out of there by the end of this week, and then they'll be moving out probably right after Thanksgiving. Uh, they did real well once they had some mechanical issues figured out, and then they figured out how to best excavate that pit so they could get the best out of it. They've done real well. They benched it out, and they got us a nice pile of gravel, and it's probably going to hit in around 38,000 tons where we ended up at. So, so yeah. that bill probably coming in the next batch? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was a good deal for them and us and everything. So speaking of pits now, we're out of inch and a half in Ormerston, which is good. We've used it like we wanted to. We're drawn on the three-quarter. We've got about 50,000, maybe 45,000 at Hay Camp and still crushing. Uh, like I said last week, he'll come in to do repairs on the crusher. We're going to have around 40,000 at Mancus, and then we are out of material down at McCamel, so we slide in there and we start this circle again, and I think we're in good shape again. So it's worked out the way we hoped it would and we expected it to, and that's where we want to be to continue on down with what we're doing. So, so there's the schedule. So Monday morning uh, we leave for CCI, and everybody's got work lined up, so they should be good to go. So. Um, John left for that, but I'll go ahead and hand this out. I need to discuss some uh, ideas that I have here for, I think you have this on the big screen. Cattle, mm -hmm. Cattle guards. Uh, Road 41 is becoming an issue. This is Weber Canyon. Um, more landowners being, buying more land and splitting it up more and different things are happening down there and BLM access and certain things. So um, last week we had a little disagreement with some landowners down there went and looked at the road the road is being improved with the landowners they fall in that uh, primitive road classification and so they've been working diligently with a little bit of county gravel to improve the road which means now that there's more and more people going into that area and i just want to remind everybody this was a road that at best was a jeep trail for all these years right i mean at, at best it was a four-wheel drive road but it's turning into a two-wheel drive road now and there's some historical gates down there that go across the county road. Our policy with the county is not to allow gates uh, crossing roads, uh, but I think all of us for many generations now look the other way on this particular road just because it is what it was, but it's no longer there. You know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, people are buying land, they want cows, they want ranching, they want access to the BLM, they want a lot of things. Where's this road, Rob? This is Road 41 down Weber Canyon. So what I want to do here is, is propose to the board this morning to set some guidelines to install cattle guards, if that's what they choose. I mean, they don't have to put a cattle guard in. They can right. put electric gates. They can put push-button gates. Uh, let me wrap up the story. We did have a letter from the website, from the website that uh, a um, disabled veteran was not able to get into the BLM down there because he couldn't get in and out of his vehicle without help to open his gates. And... That's where I drew the line and said, okay, gates have got to either be taken down, removed, or in the reasonable access to get to the gates or through the gates. So I'm working with the landowners on that. Some want cattle guards. Some may want push buttons. I, I really don't care. I think cattle guards are a better option. I don't even know if push buttons. I mean, we can allow it if we want to, but I don't know that legally they can put <coughs> push button gates across. There's a, it's a good point. I'm glad you said that because there's one on Road J. We've mm -hmm. allowed it for years and years, and you drive up, you push the button, the gate opens, you drive through, the gate closes automatically, and I've had no problem with it. They're like the same thing on Weber Canyon. They're working their own thing down there. And so Obviously, we allow it. That's fine. Um, yeah. But I think that we have to allow it. I don't think that legally they can do that without our permission. Okay. Cat That's what saying, yeah. Cattle guards work. Cattle guards mm -hmm. aren't obstructing the roadway. Mm -hmm. So my, my proposal today is, is I don't personally think that the road department is in the cattle guard business. That's just my opinion and taxpayer and all that. Um, if somebody needs a cattle guard, I'm not against the cattle guard, but I think they ought to maintain it. They ought to take care of it. It's their cattle guard. Now, I may be wrong, but that's the way I look at it. So How's that going to be with snow plowing and things like that? Will it drop stuff in there, cleaning it? or Well, we don't plow that road. Okay. So that's, that's the road. I was just thinking mm -hmm. if you're going with general cattle guards. Well, there was one suggested over at K.3. Right. Remember, so mm -hmm. I'm just trying to. And that one was a bad one because they were trying to have an open range in a subdivision with a lot of people living there and public safety on the roads. You know, when you get to that point, you should have a fence down each side of your right of way to keep the cows out of the road. So that one kind of went away on public safety. This one, I look at this as it's a, it's a tool for the person that wants to keep their cows in their place. 
and if they need a cattle guard or a swing gate or something that somebody can open as a disabled person, I don't care which one they choose. But it's their system, not mine, because we don't allow gates on roads. And so I look at this as they should put it in, they should maintain it. You know, it's their, it's their cattle guard. So. But aren't you, in an essence, saying you can't have a gate on it if you put an electric gate across the road, even though it's electric and can be open, you're still placing a gate across that road? We've kind of keep that in a gray part as well. I guess we can live with it if you don't lock it, if you don't put any no trespassing signs on it, if you don't discourage people from going through a gate. But I think we all know you put a gate up, you think twice before you go through it. It's just a natural instinct. So uh, that's why I don't particularly like gates, is it leads you to believe you're not even allowed in there, right? Yeah, so. yeah, they're illegal. We can we can not allow them to do right. it. And if we allow it, I think that's fine. But, you know, it's our discretion to allow it. So they, they, you can't just put a gate across the county. Well, if it's livestock and that's their concern to keep their livestock in their property on their place, to me, a cattle guard is the... Yep. Sensible, mm -hmm. sensible answer to that, and then you have no obstruction mm -hmm. in that road. Uh, yeah, it's written into the road laws. I mean, that's what they anticipate or cattle I mean, guards. That's what I prefer to see. Now, I know that we have some cattle guards that we've worked with the entities such as BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, where we shared the cost between two entities to put a cattle guard, you know, like out on, <coughs> on the road 12 maybe, or going out road 10. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's those issues, but that's where we border another federal agency, and we're, we're splitting a county to an agency. But as far as a personal cattle guard in the middle of a county road that has nothing to do with the county other than your shirts, I think that this should be their responsibility. So this is the way I look at it. So, so I would, we don't have anything written, so I put this together, and I thought this morning if you would review it, um, make comments on it as usual, and then <coughs> accept it or don't accept it. At least I have some ground yes. work, some groundwork to work with. You and know, the, so. the minimum bypass bypass gate is so that you can get cattle around the cattle guard. Absolutely. Or if the cattle guard caves in, you can still drive around it till yeah. they get it fixed. Yeah. So um, I want to make sure we're not responsible for the cattle guard and damage or the damage <coughs> to the car because the cattle guard is not our issue either. You know. So. Gentlemen, need commissioners need time to review this, or are you good no. with it? Well, I'm good with it. Yeah, I think it spells it out pretty plainly what we what we're willing to accept on on our right of way. Do, do we need a motion to? John might say it's just going to go into record that way we have it for on file. So yeah, sure, do a motion. I, I don't have any problems with it. I'll, I'll move that the. Uh, proposal that the road department has presented for a policy on cattle guards within the county right-of-way be approved? Second. Motion second to approve the proposal by the road department on cattle guards and the stipulations in this paper. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now that's great. Now with that, I will now for proceed with uh, notifying the people down there. Some of them are all about it. Yes, uh, when especially there's one fellow that lives way down there, and he's kind of a <coughs> recluse, loves his life. He was glad to see that um, the uh, ADA would be respected, and uh, he sent me a very nice email saying, I'm with it. I'm all about cattle guards, no more gates. And I think some of the new owners that want to run cows down there are going to be in full favor of it. And I think this is a good move, especially in this particular area where we're starting to get enough activity there. So, so there's a gate there right now? Though? There's three gates. And um, in fact, Melissa, what did she do? She took off of that. <laughs> are, are, they, are they open or disabled right now? They're open. They're not locked. But they're not open. They're closed. But there's a sign on there that says, please close the gates when you go through them. So. Don't you have another picture or something else? Yeah, there's another picture there of the gate. So. It, it, some people don't want to, they like their gates, but you know, I knew this law was there, but we just didn't have a, a, a way to get around, or not a get right. around, a, a way to address it. And this does, this gives me that authority now to say, that's it, the gate goes away, you put a cattle guard in, the commissioners approve the use of cattle guards. Right. And we can do so that, if they so. don't remove the gate, who's going to remove the gate? Well, probably me and the deputy. So, yeah. Yeah. I what, one issue that um, I think there's a picture I'm here. always worried about with gates, they're not allowed to have them there. Um, but rather than, you know, bulldoze through them, we probably, 
they own the gate. So if we can either disable it by just cutting a little chain link lock or whatever, that's probably the best way. And then removing it and <coughs> putting it on the side, you know, without damaging it as, as mm -hmm. best we can, probably the best. Uh, but definitely give them notice of when we're doing this. Now, um, this is this is a gate that started a lot of the issue down there. And you can see in the for the background, you can see where there's an old gate post there laid on. Mm -hmm. And it was more center to the road. Well, the road's not wrong. The, ga the gates, the fence is not wrong. The road just kind of makes a zigzag through there. So this started this. Well, you got a gate post out in the middle of the road, so to speak, or on the shoulder too far. We're going to knock it out within cattle trucks. And I go, well, you're not even supposed to have a gate, so you might be taking it down anyway. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of the three that is not locked. And you see a little cardboard deal in the right middle of the gate. It says, please close the gate. You know, that's always been courteous down there, but. Again, commissioners, this, this road was a two-track Jeep trail four years ago. They've come a long ways in four years just maintaining their own road down there. They've got it now where they're selling land. Mr. Hoffman is selling property and real estate business. And you know the old saying, when you build it, they will come. And yeah. there it is. So now the gates kind of become an issue. So, so this landowner, very nice people, they don't want to get rid of the gate, but... They don't want a cattle guard, but this this morning we'll tell them that you're going to have to get a cattle guard. So. This is the one that the email was talking about. Yeah. So there's two other gates. Mr. Rance down at the bottom has already removed one. He got that done Thursday. And so he's he's on board with the ADA, believes in it, and I think that's nice. And we're allowing people to get to the BLM properties without any restrictions now. So. So, Why wouldn't he put a 16-foot gate in there? Well, that is a 16-foot. So, that is? Yeah, and so what he, and the guy that built the fence, he's a ranch kid, he knows you don't put a latch post in the ditch because then it gets knocked out. Uh -huh. So he just shifted everything over to make it work. There's still 14-foot of room through there. It's just it kind of looks weird, you know. But that's Stop what that. that's what got my attention to go down there. I got a few phone calls. Will you come look at our gate and see if you can settle an issue? <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty easy to settle. I'm gonna put a cattle yeah, guard in there. Do yeah, so, gate and put a in. yeah, so so I think we're gonna be fine. All the neighbors are getting along pretty well about this gate business, and, uh, and I just needed to be able to tell them to go put a cattle guard in and, and yeah. have the back end of the board. So. So is this the same place where the where what we spoke about last week, where the person wants to replace his fence? Yeah, except he's on up the road in the foreground or the background, and he's going to do exactly what we talked about: get out of the bar ditches and build it. This attorney that contacted us was worried about this post being out there and the complaints about that, and so this attorney might have something to say about these posts right here. Uh, yeah, no, the ones in the foreground, right? The new post. These right here. I'm afraid what the attorney for that guy's going to say, John, is that it's been historical. The gates have been there for years and years and years, and under a historical basis, they can stay. I don't think they can, but he's got a, he's got the right to say historically that's the, where the road is for the know. width of the road. Right. Yes. Yeah. He does. But he's kind of casually mentioned historical rights for gates, and I go, I don't know about that. So I kind of just backed away from that one. So. Um, I mean, I, I could look into it farther, but I, I don't think that you can yeah. ever have a gate across the county yeah. road without our permission, the road department's permission. That's the way it's supposed to be anyway, yeah. So. And how long are the gates? Not all, I mean, how historical, how long have they been there? Because well, Larry Lee has lived there his whole life as a kid, used to go down there to play and hunt, and it was gates there his whole life, and he's 50. So they've been there a long time, yeah. So, but... Times change. Times change. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly Times what it is. Change. If it was still a Jeep trail and barely could get through it, then I don't know there'd be an issue. But Probably. the fence they're replacing isn't going to be any closer to the road. They're not. No, near the fence they want to put in the new fence. I showed them, I took them a copy of our road standard, mm -hmm. and I said, you can do whatever you want. You can size this 24 foot down to 10 foot if you want to, but you still need a three to one slope to a ditch and a back slope. And if that's how you want your road to be, that's where the fences need to be. Mm -hmm. And if those roads are historically <coughs> 16 foot, I can't make them go any wider unless we buy the land, they donate the land, or we condemn the land. And I don't want to go through that, go through that. for all the little road down there. They're, they're good people, and they've got good roads, and they're doing a great job of developing what they want, and they're happy with what they got. Mm -hmm. We just want to make sure that the fence doesn't get built along the shoulder of the road, right, and right. we can't blade it or something. Right. You know, right. so. And they're very open to that. And I showed them, and they go, oh, that's neat. And they, and they We laid it all out with the tape measure. And this is where they right. In fact, we landed right where they had the marks for the fence post. I go, there you go. Mm -hmm. Have fun. Build a fence. You know, so we're good. So, because based on that being not on section lines, it's it's private property. Easements through private property. So, 
change the rules a little bit. So, so there we go. That's where we're at. Um, last, and then I'll get out of your hair for today. Is do you remember the little deal that came over the email from CDOT or whoever it was, CCI, I mean, for the Colorado Office System Bridge Program? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I tried it. <coughs> I went and talked to Ed Archuleta because he's retired. Yeah. He works for Yay and Associates. Ed being an expert on the internal workings of CDOT. Yeah. yeah. Probably is a pretty good idea. It's pretty expensive. But I need to send this application in this week if we're going to attempt it. So unless I should have three pictures of the bridge that I'm interested in. Thank you. I'll make this quick. So basically, they put a proposal together for me to apply for this money from CDOT. Ed believes that there's probably a pool of money sitting there that's available this year that we should be trying to grab before they change the 287 laws and different things. So if you look at your engineering, and this is why I hate bridges, because they're, yeah. <laughs> you just can't go put a, timbers across them anymore with liabilities and fl flooding and water, and you've got to get engineering. And this is an estimate, trust me, this is, this is an estimate. But you know, they're looking at 325,000 in engineering, designing, uh, we we're talking about what they call a contact bridge. Basically, you build two abutment walls and you put an arched form system over and set them <coughs> right on the concrete walls and you pour a deck across it. Um, it allows you an open culvert, I mean an open bridge effect rather than culverts because Alkali Creek is notorious for flooding and trees and lots of big things. So you don't want to go in there and put in box culverts and things that restrict the flow or you're just going to do that. So this bridge is on the hit list for CDOT's inspection. It's got uh, problems on its uh, substructure. It's got problems with its drainage issues around it and through it. Uh, the bridge width, I think there's another picture there. There should be three of them. The bridge width is, what's that? It's uh, Road Nancy, Alkali Creek, just west of 21. Or, yeah, west of 21. Down by the Samara country. Samara country, yeah. Um, the bridge was built years ago with the beams underneath it, but they're starting to show a deflection now with weight on top of the bridge metal fatigue, um, scouring on the bottom, foundations are scouring out, rusting. So it's on CDOT's inspection list as one that needs to be addressed. So I picked this bridge because of that. Um, we would like to build it with a little more camber so when you go through that curve through there, you get your cars leaning more towards it instead of coming down and flat. Like yeah, and be wider so we can run. Right now you can barely get two cars across it at once. It needs to be another half a lane wider, you know. So I said, okay, Ed, let's go look at this one. So this is when they put a proposal together. So you won't see any of this happen till 2020 as a completion date. It wouldn't even start till 2019. But I'm starting to figure out through Mancus and Bayfield and these projects on these bridges, it takes a year or so just to do design and all that. So this is just an estimate to proceed with an application, an application to go to try to get some money. So basically it's $1.6 million for engineering, build the bridge, the whole works. Um, it's an 80-20 split, so that means we'd own 20% of this. Whether we do it with cash, or we do it with matching in kind, there's not a lot of work I can do on a bridge in kind. It's just, you know, there's some this, road work. And, this is CDOC? Yeah. CDOC is super, super, super picky about their paperwork. Ask James how it was on that little parking lot. So they would prefer cash match, I'm yeah. sure. Just have that up front, just because then they complained, well, you didn't measure You didn't measure that right. Mm -hmm. Your hour was off by half an hour. I mean, and, and minute, picky things. In all reality, with a bridge, there's only the approaches that I could probably do anyway with our crews, mm -hmm. and that would be the road part of it, you know, repaving or whatever, or chip sealing. That's you do some riprap or something. Riprap, if there's any of that. But it's pretty minimal when you're looking at 20% of 1.6 million. About 300,000. 260,000 or something like that. So... I mean, it's one of them things where we would have to give up a couple of little road jobs for a year there to build a bridge or fix a bridge, or maybe I could come up with 100000 in match and then the rest cash. I just don't know these answers yet. It's happening so fast. And mm -hmm. I just, before I send this in, I want you guys to know what this is, and do you want to send it in, or do you want to just tell Ed, thank you, but no thank you, we're not interested at this time. And 
try to work out a different solution to this bridge well, problem. We've got two years before we have to right. worry about coming up with it. And there's another bridge at Mancus, the one that goes up to uh, Echo Basin. It's in the same boat. I yeah. mean, it's a, it's the same thing. And so I think you should uh, send it in. Yeah. We can always deny it if we, I mean, if we can't do it, we can't do it. Well, who, and I can't promise you it'll be 1.6 million yeah. either. I mean, we know the floodplain is minimal. It's not a huge one. Right. You know, we know that the EPA and some of the things will have to be dealt with as far as, uh, you know, is environmental this issues. engineering estimates? Is this our engineering estimates? No, this no. is basically, this probably comes more from Bechtel because they just finished the big one over at uh, Bayfield with the same grant system. Hmm. So. You're looking at numbers from Bechtel. Mm -hmm. Not to say that we couldn't go out and get proposals from other engineering firms, you know, but we have to apply first and let's get the ball rolling. So I didn't like this whole thing because it only gave me a week and a half or two weeks to do yeah. this, you know, and that's not a lot of time to put a lot of thought into something. So. Yeah. At least you didn't get the guy that's over to Drangle that did the seven million dollar bridge. Oh, I did. I did talk to some of those guys, and uh, there's some funding that's not going to be there next year. Uh, they've already shelved the project from the Lewis Oriole School to Cajon next year. Well, uh, they've, yeah. they didn't the project. Their funding has dried up, so they shelved yeah. the Road S intersection until they get that funding re-situated. It's a long story, but yeah, their their funding is all out of whack right now, so. Maybe they shouldn't have spent 600 million to build their new building in Denver. Uh, that, well, actually, they're, what are they doing? They're, they're bonding, bonding all of their, their mortgage, and what they're basically doing is a fancy way of saying we're mortgaging all right. our properties to get loans on them and do it through, it through a loan system right. and a bonding system, which seems crazy to me. But also, they're looking at $99 million to finish that road up from Farmington Hill to reconnoiter that to make that whole now the, mess over there work. Right. So I, I, I hope we're not part of the money that we had allocated for our projects over here is going to get put into that big deal. I don't know. I don't know how I'm real nervous about yeah. that whole deal over there, man. I'll tell you that's. Yeah, it, it, it very well could have been. Well, then that would dry up our funding dry, for here for everything. Yeah, it would dry up. Yeah, it, for one yeah. project. Yeah, it is. So, if you want me to, I'll sign as approved by me and send this in as an application and see if we can get it done. So I think the commissioners are in agreement. I believe Commissioner Artell has one other item. Or do you, are you sign that? Are you, are you sending it on sure both bridges or just one? You're doing both bridges, Rob? It says we should, in case we don't get one, we get the other, you know. So, yeah, it'd be both bridges, this one and the one on Road 44. Yeah. And Road 44 is a little more unique because there's no bypass around it, so it's going to require a little more uh, money to build a bypass around the bridge, put some temporary culverts in, build a shoe, shoe fly around it so you can build a bridge, which is in my case would be good because that's matching work that I can do. Yeah. You know, we're not yeah. particularly bridge builders, but we can sure move some dirt around some and build some roads. Some yeah. Some roads so, yeah. Right, let's address this issue and then well, move on. We got a certified letter from a Summit Ridge uh, property owner in regard. Have you seen this letter from uh, Mr. Yeah. Sean? She forwarded yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not. I'm. I'm not real certain what he's talking about here. So, so I. I just saw that this morning. Is that this? Is that what you're? Is that same no. Thing? No. Did John get this? I in? think I sent it to him also. I didn't read that. It's about road yeah. instructions on his road. And it's his road. Right. So I'm not real sure what he's talking about. I haven't spoken to Rob about it. I did forward that to Doug Roth just to see if it's included in. Um, that 70s plat that says all the roads are open to the public and Doug tells me that it is and so uh, my intent was to respond to him saying that mm -hmm. sorry you're wrong but you know, mm -hmm. we'll be glad to consider any sort of documentation what? you give us that shows that you have fee simple title to these roads. Yeah. Yeah. What's he talking about that uh, they're wanting to build? Signs. Oh, just just signs? We went put signs up last week. I guess those are the obstructions. I don't know. He's saying that you're planning on obstructing his road, I think. With was, signs and whatever. He doesn't say with signs, but. Well, uh, somewhere he mentioned <coughs> signs in the last paragraph of the last sentence. Uh, yeah, it says, you are hereby placed on notice that I will retain sole control over any work or construction on my property, including culvert, signage, cattle guards, or miscellaneous projects that I am under no obligation to secure any authorization from the county. But 
but he is. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, and their county roads. It looks yeah. like to me that that his are not any different from anyone else's. That yeah. he's just trying to um, somehow assert that. Uh, this is something that you would do if you were, you know, if I was trying to adversely possess your property or something, then I'd give you notice that this is, I'm doing this and this is mine and stay off. Um, unfortunately for the public, they can't adversely possess government property. It's written into the laws. There's no such thing as adverse possession of county-owned mm -hmm. property and, and our easements and stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, him thinking he can probably do that, but he can't legally do it. It doesn't make any legal difference. That he asserts that, but at the same time, we don't want him necessarily <coughs> interfering with the road department. So I do think I should respond to him and tell him that we'll consider whatever documentation he wants to provide us that shows um, anything differently yeah. than what you know our plat says. Uh, but the plat says those roads are open. Yeah, the, sub, the plats of the subdivision say they're <coughs> public roads. Did they not say they were sixty foot too? I don't know. I don't remember. I think I remember yeah. saying sixty foot easements. I think so too. So yeah. we're well within the sixty foot. Yeah. It's All right. Well, we need to respond to that. To give that to John or to Kim or John or Kim or Kim or John or. And just to follow up to that, we are working with uh, some of the landowners down at the very south end, and they're just being super nice, and we're working with them with some gravel, and they're doing their own hauling and they're doing their own spreading, and Good. we were upblading all the Dolores roads in that subdivision last week so while we were there we swung through with a blade and cleaned up their gravel that they'd laid down with their backhoe and smoothed it up and tremendously good uh, uh, relationship with them very nice people so, so we're working working that direction and then we did put all the signs up that said no winter maintenance and that's probably what started this letter so uh, one more question then I'll leave um, you went to the McCamel water meeting was there any conversations about future ditch repairs piping plumbing pipe installations to stop spilling water on the roads and erosion issues because I know the sheriff's department's been working with us and them they're working working well with us too to help eliminate some of those bad areas down there was there any conversation there wasn't any conversation about that okay be something to visit about if you ever get that opportunity because I always try to visit <coughs> with them and they're a they're a good bunch of guys and they're mm -hmm. trying their best but there are some very old ditches and things that are uh, pretty hard on the road down there right, yeah so I'd like to see hopefully some conversation in that if you're doing good yeah, yeah, good boy. if they come up with another meeting on the 6th on we'll bring like a point bring good that'd be great because it I think they all want to help it's just a matter of trying to get organized on it you know so yeah. I'll just bring up to um, working with the bank and the realtor trying to um, finish the purchase of that property at Pleasant View mm -hmm. okay. they're asking for things that are a little bit different the bank says we can do without this and that and so they'll probably have John involved in some documents because it's not a traditional closing that a realtor is used to. So they're used to having title company and those right. Right. Things. So, we don't need that. Yeah. so they should be we'll able to work through that. that. But <clears throat> all right, thank okay. you, Rob. You're and we'll go right on to public lands. So we have Connie Clemson, Marietta, and Derek Pearson going up, and we have all three. Good to see you. Yeah. Bingo, bingo. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Hi. <coughs> morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Hello there. Um, about 50 50 right now, yeah. I'm not, not on my best game today. I'm 100%. Yeah, good. 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 I do not want to fire Larry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, who would like to start first? Oh, I guess they want me to. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Happy holidays. Yeah, it's coming. So, uh, we're forging ahead with the Sam Canyon stuff, working uh, closely with um, James. Dietrich, so we're looking forward to kind of a, a written proposal from the county. I don't know if you guys are going to submit an alternative or whatever, but we're plugging away, and I think those conversations are going really well, and everybody's very excited about just, you know, keeping this moving. So just uh, my compliments and kudos to, to James for doing all the work that he's done on that yeah. and um, moving that forward. So appreciate that. And I don't know, we were going to try, we have a new video for the monument that we just um, 
put online so it's accessible on our Facebook page for Canyons of the Ancients. We like that because we like the hits, you know, you get hits, you get score. Um, but it's also on YouTube for people who don't do uh, Facebook and you should just look under Discover for yourself. We're going to try this, but Melissa wasn't sure if we could do well, it. It, it. It came out. You can do it on YouTube. You can do it on YouTube and also. To kind of get out of here. But we didn't know if the sound, how the sound so would the be neck, here. Yeah. Oh, there it is right there. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about the sound. I got to find my sound. So it's about eight minutes long, just so if you start snoring, somebody mm -hmm. next to you might hit you. But <laughs> Is it which one? The first one, the first one right there. And you can expand that screen <coughs> on the bottom of the slide. Where? Just by the hand on the bottom. Canyons of the Ancients National Monument was designated by Presidential Proclamation in 2000. It's located in the southwestern corner of Colorado, just west of Cortez and Dolores. We're kind of at that location, the high desert, right before you hit the Rocky Mountains. So it's a very, very diverse region that we have. The monument's 176,000 acres. Canyons of the Ancients National Monument may be one of the best representatives for the concept of national conservation lands where we could look at both those resources that we use as well as those things we want to protect and to see could we do those different types of uses together. 80% of the monument is leased for CO2 development and oil and gas and it's been an active CO2 development field. So we have been able to manage that extraction and avoid all archaeological sites. Recreation is one of the many uses uh, that exist out here in this really rugged landscape. Backpacking is one of the opportunities that people can really take advantage of here in this isolated location in the backcountry. There are great opportunities for mountain biking in the monument, no matter your skill level, and we do have some great trails. There are so many places that you can see. Horseback riding is a really popular pastime on the monument, and you really get that sense of the Wild West when you're out there. When you're looking at that paradigm and trying to figure out how all those things can be done in concert, um, it does take a lot to do that, but I really believe that it can be done. In Montezuma County, we have Mesa Verde, we have Hope and Weep. We have opportunities for people to go and visit very developed sites. And some people feel really safe in that environment. Well, Hope and Weep National Monument um, was designated in 1923. I mean, when you look at the sites, you're looking at the incredible examples of the masonry that the Ancestral Pueblos were able to build here. And we have stone masons today who come here and cannot believe that these structures are not only still standing, but how impeccably made they are. National Park was established by the president in 1906. It was the first park of its kind, national park of its kind, that commemorated the works of ancient man. It provides an entire, a very comprehensive view of how the ancient people, how those ancestral Pueblos occupied the area. But other areas, such as uh, Canyons of the Ancients, provide a more solitary um, experience in, in a less structured environment. What we have here is an opportunity for you to visit some developed sites um, where there's some interpretation. But the big experience that we can offer that other units cannot offer is the opportunity to discover this place for yourself. 
come out, have your own adventure, uh, really get close to what the resource is and understand why it's important for that resource to be protected. This place is amazing. We came out here because it's off the beaten path. It's sort of out in the middle of almost nowhere, with all this country around us. And it's a great place to explore. And it's not overrun with people. It allows you to really feel the place. You get a sense for maybe what it was like to live here. Well, when I first came to the Canyon of the Ancients National Monument, I was really blown away by the history of it. I really want to be able to go and explore for myself. I don't want people to tell me exactly how to take my trips and where I, where I go. But as an American, as someone very interested in the history of the land where I come from, there's not a lot of places I can go and have that intimate connection in a non-curated sense. It's also one of the most archaeological studied landscapes in the country. It's a really amazing place. Uh, you can uh, feel, feel the past, you can touch the past. Uh, there is a direct connection between the past and the present. I think it's a great opportunity for my students to come here to study these ancient structures face to face. These buildings, uh, these places are so connected to modern Pueblo people. This was actually a pathway to a group of Zunis who were migrating north. Uh, they were called Sewekwe. This was a excellent stopping point and, um, and a place to uh, utilize the resources out here that gave a sacred space. A lot of sacred spaces were built. The cavas are um, evidence of that. The essence is still here in its roots and its strong. The history of this region is so full of the cultural aspects, poor from Paleo-Indian people who lived here prehistorically uh, to current times. So this is a homeland to many Pueblo and people who still consider this important for contemporary cultures. It's part of our history. It's where we came from. It's who we are. These places are special to me because it's me. <laughs> it's who my people are. It's who I am. It's who I identify as, as a Shui native. Being here, it makes me feel good inside. It makes me, it makes me happy. It's almost as if the wind the breeze is your ancestors talking to you, telling you you're here, you're home now. Well, it said Zuni tribal member, and then he, they live in Cortez. So. Oh, okay. So, it, anyway, mm -hmm. kind of showing what we are, talking a little bit about that we're a uh, working landscape or multiple use. Mm -hmm. If people go <coughs> out there, you know, they can have an experience that's that's different and and hopefully it will provide the respect that those resources um you know can provide us and the protection and you know visitors that can um have their own experience because really what we're going to be sort of talking about more in the very new, near future is <clears throat> it's a it's a national monument people come there to visit national monuments we want them to be able to do that safely and to become stewards for these landscapes in Montezuma and Dolores County. So that's kind of that, that motivation. And, and to add us to that entire portfolio of you can visit archaeological sites that are all very developed, and that's why we've included, you know, Hoven Weep and Mesa Verde to something that's a very personal, individual experience. So, and our state office did this, so um, we've got some pretty good talent there helping us out.
So talking about safety, and you brought this up at the very first of the conversation was James, <coughs> he wasn't in here yet, but about uh, an agreement or a memorandum that you talked about the parking lot. Oh, like what we would need is a proposal from the county about what that that part in the county right away is that you want, sort of. And then I didn't know if you guys were going to do a proposal. And I just mentioned that we were working through all of that uh, with us. And we have hired our supervisory park ranger position um, that does all the visitor services stuff who will be working very closely now. And that's David Sanders, who's been most recently working at Trace Rios Field Office. So we're very excited to have him on board. and. Uh, I think we can, we're right where we feel like we're really going to get some traction now with some of the things that we've been working on. And, you know, I just do need to, you know, also let you know that for BLM, they're not funding facilities at this point. No new facilities, no new maintenance, you know, so we're going to also have to be looking for funding opportunities, <coughs> whether that's working in partnership through grants or whatever. Um, so we'll just talk through some of those details. But I think it's going really well. And, and, you know, we've gotten some, you know, drawings that James has put together for us that we're looking through. And I think we've got some input back, back to him. And we're just plugging away. This is a really important project to all of us. Yeah. Well, we feel, or at least I feel, Marietta, that uh, whatever the county's going to do within our right of way is totally contingent upon the parking lot that's going to be built on the and the ancients property there I mean that one one isn't going to happen without the other right but we still so. need to know you know what's your recommendation within in your right away and what would you recommend recommend as one of the alternatives for the project because we'll be looking at several alternatives moving forward mm -hmm. you know so I think we're anything you want to add James no I mean I think so I think Montezuma County is in a no new facilities, no new maintenance, no new anything as well. So it sounds like we might be stalemated. Well, I don't think we are. Okay. And I don't want to be. I don't think we, you know, we've got to find some, some resolution and some opportunities to deal with that issue. So we'll just, we'll just work through it and really keep moving forward i think with some you know new new you know enthusiasm with a new staff person on board all right anything else for marietta commissioners anything on our flow dine and we're plugging um, away we've got the yeah, specialist okay. reports in and they're writing the ea and working through all of that and i think um I just talked to Garth last week, and they're finishing up most of the specialist reports by uh, mid-January, so that's pretty good progress. Uh, it's my understanding that SHPO has weighed in and maybe slowed it down? No, SHPO is not at this point weighed in. We haven't submitted anything to them from our 106 yet. Those are the specialist reports that we're working on that will then get, get submitted. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, who would like to go next? I can jump in real quick. I don't have much to update the commissioners on. Um, I believe that I updated James a week or so ago that I had um, received a red line write-up of the monitoring and develop a discovery plan for Phil's World. And uh, based on that red line from SHPO, I elevated it to our state office for reconsideration. And right now we have a revised plan that we're submitting to SHPO based on the state office input on that. Concurrently, I'm sending the monitoring and discovery plan to the Hopi tribe who had asked for a copy of it. So we sent that out last week. Hope to get input on that from the Hopi um, soon. And then as soon as I hear from the Hopi, I should be able to submit it formally to SHPO, the monitoring and discovery plan that our state office supports. So. That's where we're at, and I, I guess, guess, I guess I'm, I'm 
Um, tribe? Um, through tribal, tribal consultation, as you know, we're required to do government to government consultation. Mm -hmm. The Hopi had asked for um, involvement in this particular project, and so they wanted to know what we were proposing in a monitoring and discovery plan. So, mm -hmm. so that's our next step on the tribal consultation side of it, mm -hmm. Keenan. So, okay. yeah. And has your state office uh, changed the, the plan very much? Um, we have seen. Let's see. They did not accept a lot of the red line changes that the SHPO had proposed, and I'm happy to share with the county uh, draft version of that. So I'll send it to you. But essentially, um, they stayed with our original monitoring and discovery plan, Larry Don, and with a few changes, a couple of additions as far as um, involving workers on the trails and, and talking to them about, you know, if they were to encounter a cultural resource. So they, they asked us to beef that up a little bit, but most of the rest of it is pretty much the same and happy to share that draft. But we hope to be final plan at this point. So. We, and last week we signed a letter. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about it, James, um, on this particular. Okay, yeah, so we, we did uh, you know, ask for coordination with SHPO and also, you know, I think I copied the uh, email and both of you and then uh, <coughs> Mary Ellen on that too. So, but basically it was, uh, you know, just be, be appraised of, you know, correspondence, uh, okay. you know, phone calls, things like that. For all projects, James, or specific this projects? This is specific. Um, I don't know if we worded it that way in that letter, though. But okay. The intention was to have to be specific to this project. To the Fillsborough project. Well, actually, I'll take that back. I think yeah, it was because we were broader. Yeah, yeah I think it, it was broader. Because yeah. you already have that with the Fillsborough project, as you yeah. know. Okay, for broader. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that heads up. Basically, it was a project that they're slowing down in Montezuma County. We wanted to know about it. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting with Congressman Tipton. And, uh, we were discussing different aspects of uh, federal land and, and mm -hmm. public land and stuff, and uh, the subject of wilderness study areas came up. Okay. And uh, so we were discussing that with Congressman Tipton that there have been some of these wilderness study areas that have been around for 30, 40, 45 years mm -hmm. that are just sitting there as wilderness study areas. And so when we mentioned it to the BLM and to the forest, they said, well, it takes an act of Congress to dispense with those. And Congressman Tipton looked me squarely in the face and said, that's not true. He says those wilderness study areas were made administrat administratively by the BLM or Forest Service or whoever did the study area or wanted this parcel of ground to be a study area. And he says, with that coming from an administrative action by the BLM or one of the public land agencies, Congress has no truck in dispensing with that. That has to come administratively from the agency that implemented the wilderness study area. So I said it's a fallacy that Congress is going to now step in and step over the top of the administrative action <coughs> taken by the BLM or the Forest Service and tell them to dispense with that. It has to come from within. Well, so I, I need some real clarification right. on that. You know what, Keenan, we're, we're happy to get that to you, okay. um, and, and I'll provide that clarification. But um, I do believe that, yes, it's correct that we administratively mm -hmm. have drawn those WSAs. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that Congress has asked us to manage those so that they can make a decision on whether to release mm -hmm. or move them forward to we wilderness. Sure so let's make that, sure that we get you. Absolutely. Because he, Absolutely. he has a whole other version of that. Absolutely. So, I, I, I think, think it's important uh, to clarify. Some, uh, muddy water here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right, Connie. The way that you characterized okay. it is well, always been the thing. So the we'll, we'll so. just share the information that we have and yeah. get it worked out. Happy to do that. Oh, I, will. I think, you know, and if that's the case, then why aren't we sending these up to Congress and saying, hey, this Weber Mountain right. Wilderness Study Area has been on the books for 40 years. Exactly. It's being treated like a wilderness area, but it's really just a study area, so why don't we make a decision? Is this going to become a wilderness? 
or, or release is it, gonna, is it just going to stay here in limbo for the next hundred mm -hmm. years? And I think there's a really good example of that that was in San Juan County where um, the Hermosa Creek legislation released part of the WSA. Congress did that. And they retained part of the WSA may and uh, have it uh, managed as wilderness as part of it. So, so I think that there is a role that Congress absolutely has here, and we'll get you that additional information. Thank you. So, and thank you for asking. So, yeah, I was confused after that conversation. I bet you were. Mm -hmm. So happy to help with that, Keenan. Um, the last item I had is just be looking for, as you know, we um, had vetted our travel. Um, access route inventory for the last several months with uh, all the counties that we're going to be travel doing transportation planning travel management in um, that official kind of comment period closed in October and we may reopen it again just to kind of keep people giving um, input on inventory but as you know we're moving forward with the Montezuma County to get that into a NEPA process now that we have um, input from the public but with that, we felt it was very important to perhaps have an open house before we release um, a proposed action to let the public know what we heard from everybody on the inventory. So if an uh, individual had commented on a particular area or trail or we heard um, trail proposals from bike clubs or motorized groups, we want to be able to share that information with the public on what did we learn during the last you know, nine, ten months? What input did we get? So we're planning on having an open house to share that information. So it won't be to share a proposal, it will be to share what did we learn from the public as we vetted the inventory. So it's, it's a very deliberate process to be transparent and inclusive with the public. Um, you're hearing what we're hearing, you know, as far as what the public input is. I'm hoping to target that for December, but it may be December, January, depending on you know, getting that information out and, and recognizing that people get busy during the holidays. So, yeah. So be looking for that. Um, I think that's basically all I had to update the commissioners on today. I have some before you call Yes. So, you know, a few months back we had the discussion about Road 36. Road 36. Uh, yes. 35.6. 35. Yeah. 35. So, anyway, we decided that those were public roads and then we changed the signs but okay. what is what is your plan you talk about a gate and you well as you know um your county county surveyor had said that there was a, a gap between the uh public county right-of-way and the blm lands um, i notified our surveyor to get with your county surveyor um, to clarify whether or not we had access to the BLM lands. So that's basically where we're at right now. We're obviously would not trespass over private property without appropriate um, rights of way or, or grants or that sort of thing. So there is no plan to put a gate in at this point um, unless we have public access. That's always important to us. So we appreciate that you recognize that the public roads that Get, get folks to their public lands, but there is that kind of unknown as they, far they as access. Get them quite there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> right. within a foot or two. They can, yeah. So that's so, what I know about that. You know, different, similar issue on back there. there. There's also a road that goes into, I think it's BLM land up near the lake. Yeah. Um, what, what has access been like back there? You know, we do have public access over by the lake, so we would have to take a look at, you know, whether or not there are other appropriate ways to get folks into the public lands. I mean, we have other access points right. um, to the summit area, but m mainly on the south end, so we need to re yeah, relook at that from the north end. But the, I, I'm talking about the area where there's actually a road that goes, I think, uh, at dead ends in private property. And then there's BLM land right next to the lake that borders the lake. Right. Actually, the lake's dam and part of the dam is on BLM. So we're, we'll take a look at that, John, and see kind of what other access points we might have. You know, the, the idea is is to, to allow people to enjoy their public <coughs> lands and have that access. Right. I'm wondering if there was ever, if there was access or has been access um, from that road to the lake. I do not know that. So do you have a road number? I can find it. I could probably figure it out too. So, 
not that so I come to the south and the south east I end. I think <coughs> I kind of know where you're at. So it comes back on oh. road 39. I think. Is it about 39? Okay, I'll sounds, check in there. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to look at all of it. And and just for the record, um, we weren't making any decisions there. We were looking at analyzing access through our NEPA process. So I want to reiterate that um, putting in a parking lot or anything like that requires a public process, an environmental analysis. So we just can't go in and, and create a parking lot without a public process. I think the thing that confuses folks because BLM is doing this a little bit more proactively is, is vetting an inventory and vetting proposals with the public before we go into NEPA has caused some confusion that we've made decisions or that we're going to be in there next week building something. We will still stick with our legal process, which is the environmental analysis process through the National Environmental Policy Act, and vet all of the proposals that we would pull together. Um, with the public. So it, it's a long way from having any decisions made. Um, the gate that we wanted to put in was if there was actually access there, um, we would have had to do environmental analysis for that. So please know that our decision process always involves the public when there's uh, federal action involved. That's the law. So how long will this that process take then after say that there's a um, a, resolu a solution between uh, with the county surveyor and your surveyor, then would you start that process? And if so, how long would it take? Um, we would do it through our travel management um, transportation planning process, and we're hoping to kick that off at the first <coughs> of the year. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it, Larry Don, is, is contingent upon how much public comment you get, how much analysis involved. I mean, you've seen it through the yellow jacket flow dime process. Some environmental analysis can go very crisply and quickly, and others take more time as the public has more interest and involvement in it. So I can't say how long it would take, but as soon as we pull together proposed action and complete scoping, I'll have a lot better idea of, of what it is that folks are are compelled talking, to comment you're talking on. Years down the road, you're not talking. Not years, Keenan. I would say I would Looking guess. At all those others in their, year, their years. Some take longer than others. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would hope that we could get that particular transportation planning EA done in 12 months to 18 months, but I can never guarantee right. what yeah. it takes. It's so, a public process. So, so your best optimistic is 12 to 18 months, which. Could then extrapolate into a couple of years without it could. almost without doubt. So. Well, hopefully so not. You know, one of the things that I want to remind you of is the reason why we vetted the inventory and are doing all this upfront work is to let people be really informed as we develop the proposed action. So the theory would be is that there's less surprise of what the BLM is going to propose as we go through this process to be more upfront, more transparent. Give us your input now. So theoretically, that would keep it shorter on the other end once we, we <coughs> issue that proposed action, once we initiate environmental analysis on it. So there's, a, there's a, a method to our madness in doing all this upfront involvement is to, to vet all of this early in the process before we actually jump into NEPA. I'll let you know. You can let me know how you think mm -hmm. that that approach works. But there's a lot of goals there. It's <coughs> it's transparency, it's involvement, and it is a goal to keep the NEPA process a little bit more um, deliberate and shorter, theoretically. Because I think that's what Commissioner Ertel is, what he's talking about. Yes. That, um, for example, uh, when Derek and Tom decided that we would work with the two counties to open up the uh, the um, campgrounds down there that, that were closed. Um, Kevin first. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah, that, that took one month, I believe, and they opened the gates up. Yeah. We haven't opened the gates, but oh. we, we've got to this point. But, so we're not done with that. Yet. Okay, but it, it's not 18, I mean, we, it's, a it's, a it's a different process, Larry Don. Yeah, it, it's n it doesn't process. trigger an environmental analysis mm -hmm. because the campground exists. It's an administrative Correct. decision on behalf of the Forest Service. So that's a different process. If it was an administrative decision in part, we don't have to involve the public because long ago, you know, there was some process that decision process that they had in place 
to have those original <coughs> campgrounds. It's an administrative decision to open or close a campground. Great. Different. Would it be safe to say then that the time frame that you're talking about is consistent with other BLM yes. directors in other states? Yes. Actually, I think it's going to be more timely because of how we're trying to do it with the upfront inventory. I'm hopeful that it won't take you know, five years or seven years. I mean, look at the travel management that you've been, been involved with previously. It can take three, four, five, several years. Our hope is to be very deliberate about the NEPA process once we initiate it. That's why we're investing in all this upfront work. I don't know, fingers crossed, guys. I mean, it's our responsibility to be open to public comment, and sometimes that takes a while, as you know. All right. All right. Well, that's a good segue, actually. Um, that's one of the. We only have two topics to discuss today, and one of them was Ferris and campground. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Ferris and uh, yeah, cabin, cabin uh, campgrounds. And uh, uh, Tom sent out, you know, a list of responsibilities for both the county and, and the Forest Service uh, related to that. And uh, we just wanted to see if you all had an opportunity to take a look at that and have any questions, concerns. Uh, and then also uh, talk about next steps. Um, as with, you guys are very well aware, you know, anytime we uh, enter any, into any kind of agreement or anything like that, it's gonna take some paperwork uh, as well as time. So um, we want to get, um, you know, things uh, agreed upon, you know, as soon as possible so that we can get that into a formal agreement and through our grants and agreements uh, process and, uh, uh, coordinator out of, out of the Durango there. Uh, so basically that that's it for that one. Uh, do you have any questions on anything? I think, and I don't speak for the commissioners, but isn't all of this um, county, 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 Dolores County? That's oh, up to you that all to, to you. discuss. I okay. mean, uh, it would be take coordination between the two counties to identify whether or not that yes, that is all Dolores County, it, that they're taking that responsibility on or if there's any portion that Montezuma's County, and that's what we want I to know. I think we discussed doing the... Um, the of the road, yeah. And but they discussed the weed control. control. Yeah, they've already done weed control. Do they, do they, do they uh, maintain the road from Bradfield to the dam, or...? Is, yes. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and so they, it would naturally be them to go into the... But our, our road supervisor said there would be a good opportunity. We have the gravel from pit Warmest at uh, yeah. <coughs> Repairing that road, blading that road for our gravel pit operation, offering would be a good time to go down and do work in, in those campgrounds. So maybe we alternate that or find a. Yeah, we, okay, that's, I mean, that's fine. We can John, all, all of these are in Montezuma County. I want to make sure you yeah, I know, them. I know, but uh, I, I think my understanding was that Dolores County was. Um, the ones that were really pushing for this and was yeah. asking to yes. actually right. do all right. of this right. and so yeah I mean I, I spoke with their county attorney two weeks ago and I think the only thing that we were unclear of that he didn't know whether or not Dolores County was agreeing to do or not was was law enforcement there and I, I suggested to him that it would make sense for they to do law enforcement too and for us to put that in the agreement mm -hmm. since all access is through Dolores, Dolores County, County. Um, but you know I felt like that part wasn't resolved, at least in his mind, but I think the rest of it is. Did, how about the water system? Yeah, the water the, system. I, don't know if it, I think that's something that we should discuss a little bit more, yeah, uh, yeah. because it's it, it's a beast that you, I mean, if you want to, if you want to tackle it, it, it's up to you, but it takes a fair amount of time. And um, these groundwater systems under the influence of surface water, um, I think CDP, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, no longer grants <coughs> those waivers. And so um, we would still have to, if it was being operated, it would still have to be sampled. And, yes, you know, monthly bacteria wow. samples and then yearly um, nitrates, nitrites, sort of this whole gambit of, 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 uh, of tests yeah. that you have to do. We would continue to be sort of the owner of that, of that water system, but whoever manages would whatever county manages it would be the responsible party for sampling, for notification if there was a bad sample, for resampling in order to open it back up. I would highly recommend that, that you consider the amount of time you want to put into operating a, a water system for a relatively short period, um, as well as a short number of users. It certainly would be beneficial 
um, but it's something that is, for instance, it's hard to secure a, a well like that for just um, non-potable use. If we decided between the two counties not to operate that, would you then go, you would be responsible for closing that off? And we would, yeah. Off that? Uh, we don't. I don't want to. I don't want to lose that water right, but we would secure it where we would maintain that water right. If, if in the future we had an opportunity re to return where we could operate it on a larger scale, but we would secure it, uh, secure the wellhead, so mm -hmm. the water right remains there. What that, kind of a right do you have with that? Tom? What it's, right it's, a, it's a point of diversion. I don't know how many you know, CFS it CFS would be. It is. Yeah, but it'd be a, it's a small, it's a small amount, but like I don't think anyone wants to give up a water right. Does um. Like, could our health department be the ones that test that water? Who do you guys have tested in the past? Our concessionaires have a certified water operator um, who goes through some training for a very, it's a very simple license. Um, it's for a license for the very simplest systems, a non-transit system that is turned on and off throughout the year. Um, I don't know if the Montezuma County Health Department has staff to do that. They certainly have the abilities to do that. Um, it's not a very technical uh, license is just simply a, 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 a licensure, some training that you have to go through, through Rural Water Association, and then keep it uh, keep it current. Uh, and so, it takes a little bit of time. Um, <coughs> That's also something that can be contracted out. I mean, there are we did that uh, a few years ago for the ones we manage because uh, we didn't have a certified water operator uh, for a little bit there, so we contracted that work out as far as collecting the samples and things like that. Uh, so that's a possibility as well. Do you remember how much it was yearly? I do not. Okay. You're, I think your mileage is going to be the biggest expense. Then you typically either have to mail those overnight or get them to Durango to San Juan Basin Health where they run the back T samples. And then other sampling protocols um, that are done at the beginning of each year require a different, um, you know, a different timing, but um, also takes, you know, take a little bit of time to get them. John, next, when you talk to the Dolores County's attorney again, we can bring up this issue about the water and see how they feel about it. And we'll be meeting with them this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. But you're, you're saying in here that that you will uh, do the initial. Yeah, I don't want to hand off a problem to whoever is going to be managing that water. So we would take the first samples. Uh, I'm pretty well guarantee you they'd come back with back tea and um, they weren't purged adequately and I know I believe we had problems in the past with bacteria in there so we'd want to do the first sample if that comes but comes clean that's great if not we would have to do another sample um, and um, and just see how long it could, see if indeed we could come up with a clean uh, no bacteria sample when you say purge can you can you treat it? Can you pour a little bit of Clorox in there? Or, I mean, well, you'd have to have a, a treatment system, and because it's under this influence of surface water, the treatment uh, criteria are, are, are it's not just treating with uh, bleach like you do, you know, with some systems. There is a filtration requirement now because of all these um, groundwater systems in Colorado that are under the influence of surface water. So many streams that have discharging systems like you see on the Dolores with um, sewer systems that are septic systems that are discharging into the into the river so it doesn't matter the fact that we're where we are on the Dolores arm just that's the criteria that we have to sample to it's not as simple as it used to be right. you, development you think that there was a problem <coughs> uh, you think there has been problems in the past uh, yeah talking with some of the folks that have been in our office for a while they, they think they have a problem and I don't know if it was because it was sampled poorly or if indeed there was something in actually in the water sometimes it can be someone who didn't wash their hands you know pouring a sa pulling a sample and didn't do a do a good quality job so um, best way to find out is to sample it and like I said here we would take care of that initial sampling <coughs> Right. So then the other one was just, uh, I sent you all uh, a, a briefing uh, of the Rico West Dolores uh, Trouble Management Project uh, draft decision, and uh, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to take a look at uh, any of that documentation, and if so, if you had any questions. Probably. Probably the same, not the same thing we looked at prior, I mean, nothing. Yeah, nothing major. Nothing major change. Correct. Okay. I thought you guys did a good job on the uh, muscle presentation. Thank you. 
Yeah, it was a pretty successful year. Yeah. If our sampling is correct in October. I was going to say, when did you last sample? The, the October 21st, when mm -hmm. it came back negative. Good. Okay. That's, that's crucial. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you had a couple people there that took the conversation in the weeds, but you had to really? so, Well, <laughs> we tried. <it's, laughs> for me, it was hard to sit there and listen to somebody go hunting where there's a bike trail and not expect to see a bike. But he has some good points about funding and things like that. That the uh, bike community is probably going to have to tackle at some point. So, unless you have any questions or anything else, that's all I have. Did you have something, James? Yes, we had a request for a letter of support for the VLM OHV trail grant. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to go ahead and get that signed. Could you just send that off? Yeah, that'd be super. Fine. Thank yeah. you. We, we passed that. Our last meeting, did we not? Well, that was for the Forest Service. Forest Service, okay. I would make the motion that uh, the Board of Knowledge and the County Commissioners send a letter of support to Mr. Tom Metza and the OHV Program Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'll second. Motion second to approve a letter for the, in support of the, of the BLM's OHV Program Manager, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. All in favor? It looks like, and I've heard from people that they used to access, this mm -hmm. is BLM property, mm -hmm. but this right. is private, like, right. you know, over. Right. And he's a gate up there. Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering what his door for access is, because you guys probably, there's a prescriptive evening. The end of County Road in yeah. and property. We, we typically don't um, affect the prescriptive. Yeah, but, real. but you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're not a we're not a public road agency. For okay. I was just curious what the access has been like yeah. there. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Public, public road agency, which is the county, absolutely is. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, this wouldn't be a road, though. This would be like the road. A ends. trail. Yeah, a trail that goes from, look into it. from private to yeah. BLM property to the lake. If it's on BLM. Mm -hmm. so that's why you guys. <laughs> if it's our road, we can. Yeah. If it's a county road, then no, and we don't perfect. Um, Access as a public road agency. I believe Forest Service has that authority now. I believe it happened when I was with the Forest Service, but um, BLM still is not a public road agency, which implies certain um, authorities that an agency would have, like the county. So thank you for signing that letter. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy your holiday. I hope you Don't eat too much turkey. Take some time. Here. I don't know. This is a great place to be in one. Wow, I'm having a staycation. This is BLM, but there we go. You see what you've not seen right in your backyard. No kidding. We don't do that as often as we should. Thank you. Do you want me to forward you that? You too? The video? All right, right now at this time we have the landfill month report. We see that Chuck Powers is in the audience, so if he would come forward, which is the uh, manager of the Montezuma County Landfill. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Hi, Jack. Good morning. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. 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 Let's see how that works. <laughs> oh, well, if you want to scroll down, I don't have a whole lot to say that's going on. I don't know what, what you had that highlighted for. Yeah. That was uh, for when we took in all that miscellaneous soil from Kinder Morgan a couple of months ago. <laughs> that was the month I wanted to show why we came out so far ahead even after that. That was, <clears throat> that, that was a, a big uh, blessing. So you can see that's got us for the year already ahead of where we were projected to be. So. And I showed him the same thing in our financials this morning. I said Shaq was over budget because of the repair that he had, but 
you also had more revenue, revenue. so we'll be doing a budget adjustment for you. Thank you. That's yeah, percent, so you're right on the money. <laughs> yeah. What do you, do you just want to know the bottom? Yes, might as well. Um, it's there somewhere, so. Um, paid a few big bills this month, uh, the rebuilding of that case so we can get it off to auction. That bill finally came due. Uh, but as you can see, we're, for the year, we're pretty far in the green, or in the black, so. Yeah, you are. Uh, we're, we're way ahead of where we hope to be. So. Thank well, you, Kay. Yes, thank, yep. you. thank you to Kingdom Morgan. And one of the things that he did do, I. I don't know if it show. Yeah, it does show that. Um, he transferred money over to the capital for the future of that that cell. So, so, that cell. so, so he's actually putting it in in the capital fund as a savings bank. account. That's smart. Yeah, that, that's the goal. Set some aside for the future. Do you so, uh, receive any recycled plastics from Mesa Bird National Park? We do. We, we received their cardboard and their plastics. Yes, sir. And have you been receiving it for quite some time? A couple of years since we started paying for products. Yes. Um, the recycle markets, uh, of course, as you know, has taken a pretty good dip. Um, now with the National Sword stuff from China going through, it, it'll stay low for a couple of months, especially probably during the holidays, but I imagine the market will start working itself out probably February, March. So, um, but our sorter's doing a great job, so we're still able to get our product to market. So, yeah. Um, the paper and plastics really took a hit. We can still pay uh, people if they bring us clean office paper, but if it's sorted, uh, we have to charge them. Uh, if it's not sorted, if it's mixed. What do you mean by mixed? So if it's got newsprint and office paper and all that kind of stuff put together, we have to charge them because the market value for mixed is 20 a ton. It takes us 40 just to bail it, plus we've hired a sorter. Um, so our processing cost is now $60, uh, uh, just over $60 a ton. So if people bring a mixed, we do have to charge. If they separate, we can still pay for it. Same is true with the plastics. So keep your newspapers out or separate? Correct. And the uh, uh, same thing with the plastics, uh, the mixed value, it's just not there right now. Um, but I we're able to sort that something other than ones and twos? It's ones and twos combined. We're having to sort them oh. down into number ones, which is like your water bottles and pop bottles, uh -huh. number two naturals, which is like your milk jugs, and then number two colors, which is like your oil jug, shampoo bottle, laundry jugs, those types so of things. you have to put those all in three different categories, though. Correct. We're having to sort all of those. In uh, is he able to keep up with that? Um, yeah, you know, surprisingly, he has been. Cool. Um, so he's been there about six weeks now, and by the end of each week, <coughs> he's got it finished. He's really uh, keeping up great with it. So. Um, when things pick back up in the summer, we may end up having to hire a tent, but we'll see when summer gets here. But right now, he's rocking it now. That's cool. What's his name? His name is Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. And pretty high speed keeping up with that. He's um, managing to do about three ton a day, so that's wow. pretty impressive. Wow. Well, I think you're not a kid. Yeah, well, plastic or paper. Paper takes a lot more time to And slide. he does that all on the floor in Correct. the in the enclosed facility with Baylor, yes. Correct. The upstairs portion of that. It might be interesting to go see him sometime. Yeah, well, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it like chest level or is it on the ground or how does he do that? Um, it's on the ground, but he has the option of scooping it up in a loader bucket and putting it at chest level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a chest level <coughs> belt. If we did, we'd have to have someone running the belt and probably more pickers on it. It would probably be more expensive to do it that way at this point. And we don't have the quantities to justify that at yet. this point yet. Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting because Durango with their stuff, I don't know if you saw the Durango Herald, but they're uh, 
sustainability bill that's on there, trash and recycling, is going up 8.5% trying to deal with this stuff. Cause, um, Which uh, recyclable is worth the most money right now? <coughs> uh, cardboard and metal. Yeah. Cardboard and metal. But, uh, um, uh, aluminum's just under a thousand a ton, but of course we defer all that to fast heavy and belt salvage because we're not in business to compete with private industry. But cardboard's hanging about 90 a ton right now. Um, mixed paper is about uh, 20, mixed plastics are about 20. Single stream, you can't get anybody to take it anywhere. Um, but once you clean the products up, the, the number two naturals. Um, underneath uh, metal are the highest, then we can get rid of those for 400 a ton. And, uh, the number two colors, I want to say we're, we can get 180 a ton and a little less than that for the number ones for themselves. The problem is the amount of time that goes into sorting them. And are you going to have a, a big batch of compost? For next spring? For the spring. Assuming it all finishes curing on time, we've got a big batch ready. It's curing, but and it, it takes us however long it takes to cool down. We temped them this morning. <coughs> They're still all above 140 degrees, and they've been sitting for a couple of months now. What makes so, them cool? Just turning? Time. Time? Just time. It just takes however long it takes for that stuff to finish mm -hmm. curing. We have to get them up to temperature to kill everything that's in mm -hmm. it. But then it takes as much time as it takes to cool down mm -hmm. whenever the microorganisms stop doing what they do. You have to keep stirring it. Um, we do temperature check it and stir it. That won't help it <coughs> cool down any faster. But that does keep the core from getting hot enough to cause fires. <coughs> so. We don't want that, do we? No, mm -hmm. we don't want fires. Do we? Oh, oh, okay, so I was talking. Yeah, we want a saleable product down there. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Selling that. And, you know. So that's where I'm at for the month. Unless you have any questions okay. or comments for me, I'll let you back on schedule. That looks good. All right. All right. Sounds you. good. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Happy Sharon. Thanksgiving. Thank you. I didn't know, but I think you were a Bomag salesman representative. Yeah. You know, as much money as we spend with them, we should all be wearing this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have social services uh, monthly report. Josiah Parker and Lori. Morning, Josiah. Morning. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Morning. How are you? Morning. Morning. How are you, buddy? Good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. All right. How's everybody? Good. Well, that's a lot of keys. Uh, there's yeah, a lot of doors around here. There's a lot of doors. I say, be glad you're not Mike. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, that's just these buildings. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we can start with going over the record proceedings from last month. Um, the numbers from last month come in at a million eight, which is about where those numbers should be this time of year. Overall budget at the end of November, we're running about 9% ahead, so we should be cruising to the finish line easily. Is this for October, though, correct? Okay. You just said November. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. That's okay. But knock on wood, there's, there's no way to lose 9% in the last eight weeks. So. We'll hope that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so finances, we're running ahead. We're running 15% ahead in the stuff that's matched with taxpayer money. We're running 6% ahead in stuff that's 100% paid by state or federal, uh, which is at 9% overall. So we're at a very healthy financial place finishing up the year. So do you guys have any questions on the finances? No, but you guys don't have to take the cake and spend more money than everybody else when we do the accounts payable. You guys win that every month. Every month. Oh, well, I didn't know that was a contest. I'll win that easily. <laughs> I'll win that. That's not even a contest. Okay. Yeah. I, would, I would have to try to lose that. I think we I think we beat you a couple months when we yeah. were making big payments on the courthouse. But other than that, other you than guys that, win yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, yeah, I don't see that changing either. 
call. <clears throat> I'll move that the what you want first, the financials. E either way, just make a decision. I'll move that the financials for the <coughs> social services department for the month of October be approved. Second. Motion second to approve the financials for the Mozart County's social service department. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have one more? I'll move that the records of proceedings for the Montezuma County Social Services Department for the month of October be approved. I'll second. Motion and a second to approve the records of proceedings for the Montezuma County Board of Social Services for the month of October 2017. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So kind of give you an update on what's going on next door. The flooring is going in. Um, all of the cubicles that were purchased for the first floor are uh, almost finished being built and will be mailed on the 28th. Uh, the holes for the new electric are drilled, so when the cubicles come in, they can immediately start assembling and installing those. Um, we have bids out right now for a painter, which is the last major expense uh, that has to go in next door. Um, we've looked at and I think we've agreed on a way to secure the building with an a series of electronic security doors that I'm very pleased with and excited about it. It'd be nice being able to tell my staff that they're safe behind locked doors and people coming in and out will have to check in at the front desk and can't just wander through <coughs> the building. Um, that we, came up this morning, I mean, when we were having a conversation with the extension agent, they said, why are we moving? Mm -hmm. I said, Beca because we are securing this whole building with exception of access to the administration on the second floor over here. Because I think at first they were like, why are, what is part of this and why are you kicking this out? Why are we <laughs> being inconvenienced or whatever? But mm -hmm. when they actually heard what we were doing and why we were doing it to secure this for social services and the DA, and, and they're going to have more space in their in more their space and they won't be um um it's more handicap accessible also there's not going to be any stairs to get to right. the extension and the noxious right. so right. i think overall other than the fact that and i'm still dealing with this myself is going through all of our things and seeing what we really have to move mm -hmm. and what we should just get rid of mm -hmm. i mean I that's an inconvenience <laughs> but it's something that we need to do anyways yep. so. yeah. <laughs> You get a roll off and park it out back. Just, and, just go. And you clean it out. <laughs> yeah, I asked Mike about popping out one of those windows upstairs. You know, you can't open them, but it would have been a lot easier to get that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, Especially the carpet. The, so, down there and, yeah. the only un unforeseen expense that we've had was on the third floor in the original part <coughs> of the west side of that third floor room uh, where the original jail was built. That, that concrete was just like the ocean, and we couldn't lay those wood planks on it so we had to oh. we had to bring in about 52 bags of concrete and level out that the west side of that third floor uh, but that's now done and it's level and it's moving forward but that was the only unforeseen expense and it wasn't bad but everything else is coming in where it needs to be um, expense wise so they'll do be starting that flooring upstairs as soon as the downstairs flooring is done um, can we talk about single point entry yeah. mm -hmm. so with single point entry moving single from the health entry point, single entry point that's Yep, what I meant, SEP. <laughs> with them moving from the health department upstairs, I'll be meeting with Peterson's at 1130 today to see if we can fit the seven cubicles necessary for their staff upstairs. And I'm um, really hoping that they fit nice and neat. And, yeah. and we SCP don't have any more for unforeseen changes. But <coughs> SEP has been, it has been approved for their funding to be able to pay for those cubicles too. Okay. So that's, yep. that's a helpful piece too. Uh, yeah. yep. But do you feel confident? I mean, was you, anticipating that she was going to be doing that? Do you have that Originally, that's what we thought. And when we had the discussion, Bobby <coughs> wanted to keep the SCP under <coughs> control. And, and that originally, the SCP wanted to move into the um, DA space. But then when we got to the point where we were trying to secure this building, it really made the extension office and the noxious weed department inaccessible. Right. So with that change, that's when it switched and said, you know, hey, they still will be health department employees. They're just going to be housed on the third floor over here, and <clears throat> that fit makes everything fit security-wise. And yeah, and so when it comes to your adult protection and um, the adult financial A and D programs and the long-term Medicaid, those are all separate departments. But generally, clients have to interact with all three of them, and I'm very excited to have all three of those right, right in the same place, so that we don't have to keep bouncing clients up and down. 
and trying to it's really a, a logistical headache for them trying to track down their own paperwork and things because we're not in the same space so I'm really excited to have them up there. I think that's going to be a good deal for our clients. Will you explain so, how, how I'm a client and I come in, how, how does that work for me? I mean, I need this service or that service. I'm thinking of the rooms downstairs. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, so what's going to happen is we're, all, all doors are going to be locked and everyone public is going to have to funnel in through these, where those doors at? These front right doors down here. here. <laughs> these front doors down here. When you walk into that lobby, whether you go left or whether you go right, there will be security doors. And so in that concrete will be a giant glass window where you'll have to check in with DHS and tell us who you kind are, like what you're here now. for. Yep. Um, and then at that point from behind the desk, we can unlock left or right, you know, or if they need to see administration, they can just go upstairs without being, without being, having to stop with us. There's a clear path to get upstairs. But what we've done in that, that second, room downstairs is we're cutting it up into five meeting rooms and where so the old treasure was where the old treasurer was and so no client will ever get more than about three steps in that doorway going that direction um, regardless of what program you're meeting with my staff will come to the door get the patient client and take them to one of those meeting rooms and so what that does for us is both of my rooms where eligibility staff are the third floor where I am at and my child welfare, those all become very HIPAA protected rooms where work can be done without worrying about client information being said out loud and some of those sorts of things. And so that's gonna be the biggest, well, two things. One, the clients never have to get more than just a few steps into the building, which is a nice safety thing. And those meeting rooms are set up for that so that the rest of the air work areas can be far more productive. And So if you come in and you need help with Medicaid or our transfer. Whatever it um, is. Whatever it is. Yep. or. To the, um, single entry point or whatever someone's going to meet you downstairs you know and those offices even if if necessary um the da if the da needs to meet with someone yeah, down there someone from this floor here can go down there and meet in a private private room with with those clients so yeah we're hoping to be hopefully it's a wonderfully better design than what we have customer now service so, oriented yeah. You know, and if, if you're here for one or two meetings, then we change who you talk to if you need food stamps or give me another program now. Medicaid. Tam Medicaid or anything like that. You can sit there and then those people come and see you and you don't have to chase back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's way more client-friendly and it's much safer because people aren't just wandering in the building looking for whatever, whoever they're looking for. So I'm very excited about it and it seems to be moving along well. Um, I would... I'm, without these holidays, I'd feel better about saying this. I'm still very hopefully optimistic in February we'll be moving bodies in. So we'll see. But all right, commissioners. <coughs> I've, got, <coughs> I've got a couple of questions. One of them <coughs> on the budget because of the way that you're financed. Yeah. There's. It's going to be hard for us to. To cut you, <laughs> put it that way. I appreciate to, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to to get to try and to make adjustments in budget. budget. Right. But are you wanting me to tell you how to cut me? Is that what you're? <laughs> asking? Are you wanting me to kind of a knife? <laughs> right. You use your own knife and tell me. <laughs> You know, so basically what that comes down to is the way our county is, and every county is set up differently. But the way our county is set up is the general fund in essence brings in X amount of dollars to which my mill levy, I have access to 1.5 mills of it, correct? So one and a half? You said, yeah, it's, it's about 800,000? Something that like that. And so- It's gonna be 600,000 When you year. say cut, when, if the general, if the overall pot coming in shrinks, then my 1.5 mills of that pot shrinks. So I, I'm operating with significantly less money than three years ago. Now, if that makes sense, because I just yeah, take 1.5 mils out of whatever the general sure. pot yeah. looks like. If you want to cut less than that 1.5 mils, that's I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to tell you to do that, and because I, I don't know historically how that 1.5 mils was set up or why. Or it's it's set as its own mill levy, so I mean, um, it goes directly to you. So it's not like we can funnel your money somewhere else because that's the way that when we yeah, set so the mill levy, it's totally set right. for social services. And it's by automatically through the tax decrease, through the assessed valuation, it's gonna go down, so. Is that the only, 
That's the only. There's nothing else comes out of general fund too. Correct. Okay. Correct. And a lot of one of the things that happens also is we um, we I don't know who we their request are addressed to the commissioners for financial assistance with this program or that program. If it has to do with and I, I don't have the right terminology. If it has to do with helping people in those certain situations, like the bridge, like. Um, Right, so historically that's how we were able to give so much cash away to other entities is because my 1.5 mills came in over and above what was required to pay salaries and those sorts of things. That number's getting a lot thinner. Access health, <laughs> the bridge um, shelter, and things like that are... Well, you used to be able to give quite a bit of cash away to those entities. And but opinion opinion project. Project. 300,000 opinion projects. But that comes through TANF, that comes through other state. Okay. That, that, that's not... Taxpayer money. Okay. They don't. They don't get a dime of taxpayer money, like straight cash. Uh, we're down to the point now where um, we don't give any cash away except maybe like a thousand dollars to the food bank, and maybe a thousand dollars at Christmas to help buy gifts for kids. But we we, we just don't give cash except away the anymore. Good Samaritan Center. Yeah, like the Good Samaritan Access Center. If help. they if their budget comes up short, we'll float them like a thousand dollars. But we we just don't give cash away like we used to because it's just not there. And one so. of the things I mean as we're as we're discuss budget more or whatever, you know, um, they're in the same boat as the health department, the road department, things like that, whatever raise or not raise or, or whatever happens, they would be put on the same situation. You know, I mean, the budget that they presented earlier did have the 2% increase in it. If that goes away, then their budget would have, uh, be adjusted accordingly. They won't be treated differently. <coughs> than you know, yes. now again, like, you know, my, yeah, you're asking me to give my money away. I'm really I'm sweating here <laughs> even thinking about it. But, you know, technically, you know, the money that's left over at the end of the year that goes into my general fund, that is general fund money. So, I mean, if we needed to operate off of a break even, you know, whatever money over that 9% that's, you know, instead of it going to savings, it could go re be reallocated somewhere else. But, you know, to take that off the front end would really, oh man, that would really be difficult for me to just maintain my staffing. Yeah. I, didn't, um, didn't, I didn't fully understand exactly how you were funded. How, how so we were funded, yeah. But if you, <laughs> that answers my question. So if you did end up with a 9% surplus at the end of December, then that money could go back into the general fund. My understanding is once it becomes general fund money, it's general fund money. Is that your understanding? And it can, you would have to do a motion to, to move that from general fund to us to somewhere else, so but I'm under the impression that that can bill. be done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, again, I'm really not trying to give my money no. away, because no. I understand it. Uh, but, but I also don't want to sit here and lie to you. I do believe yeah. once that becomes general fund money, it can be reallocated. But the question that I have is the mail, uh, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it depend on how it was worded? That the, because can't you transfer mails? To, I don't no. know. I don't know. I don't. <clears throat> Yeah, it depends on how it passed, but if it passed and it's supposed to go to social services, and that's where it's going. I mean, but that's... But if it didn't pass that way, right. and I could you transfer a mail? We'd have to look to see how it was passed. I mean, okay. And I don't know, I just... Right? Yeah. Yeah. From year to year, when we set those mills, we specifically set so much to our general fund, mm -hmm. so much to Road and Bridge, right. and so much to social services, three different pieces. It's all, it's all on the same assess valuation, whatever that, 450 mm -hmm. bazillion dollars or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but it's set as three separate mills, so mm -hmm. I do not know. Likely because it was defined that way is why you do it, though. I, so. I don't know. We ought to find that out. Yeah. Let's look it up. How, how those were established. And so. would that, Kim, do you know, would that be on the ballot? That wouldn't be a ballot issue, would it? Way back when, if those mills are set as three separate would it be a ballot issue when those were passed? It could be on the question itself, how it was. Right. So, would that be where we would look? Yeah. It's a good place to start. Because yeah. the way that the question for the school was as well, it's going to go to buses and this, but then it's going to go in the general fund at the discretion of the Board of Education. So that, to me, made a free-for-all. Yeah, when it goes general fund, then it can be sent in a lot of different directions. That's my understanding. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that would be a lot easier on me to give it to you in December than January. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Uh, two, two more questions. Yeah. We'll change the subject here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, I've mentioned this to you before. And basically, I'm asking how can this be improved? In the child support, here's on that report we got, the C standard, whatever it is, it yeah. says that 40.5% uh, of the people who owe the money are in arrears, yeah. and 60, around 60 percent of the money that's due has been collected. Is there any way to improve that? It is improving, isn't it? It is improving, which I know those numbers don't look good, but those numbers are better than when I started. Um, that's a program covered at 33 percent, not 2080. So, I mean, the first thing I would tell you is, yep, I could have easily two more staff in there, and that would get those numbers way down. But we would have to come up with 33 percent of that salary twice. Um, that would be the first thing we could do. Um, there are counties that just manipulate those numbers. They will just drop money owed down to a dollar, go collect it, and then their CSTAT numbers look really well, and they're collecting a dollar on every client and not what's actually owed. Some of that's a principle, either this is what you owe and my, my money, my CSATs don't look as good or there's, we drop it, collect less, the numbers look great, but we're really not collecting what's mm -hmm. necessarily owed to that kid. You know what I'm saying? You know, I should put um, in a plug for these guys too that, uh, I mean, Ian McLaren, who's our county attorney that does pretty much all of child support unless there's a conflict. He knows a lot of people here, so every now and then I'll take a case, but he basically covers it. He's mentioned to me on several occasions that, uh, Kathy and Kathy Glazner and um, Christy, what's Christy's last name? And uh, and, mm -hmm. and Rulu are have that the office is doing awesome, way better. That I'm super happy with them. Yeah. yeah, he's he's mentioned on several occasions how much they've improved and um, and how they're super efficient and collecting good money. Um, so maybe it is a manipulation of these things. I don't know. So that would be one response. Is I mean, if if, if you really want those CSTAT numbers to drive, I can change what people owe, and we can collect pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Like well, you know what I'm saying. Up, that's instead of owing two hundred dollars a month, you know, twenty five dollars a month, and yeah. then we're collecting one hundred percent. And then we're collecting at one hundred percent. I'd rather see it honest. Yeah, so, so that's a piece of it. You know, the other piece of this, again, we're one of only two counties in the state that, that have relate that tribal relationships, right, that we have to. And so the, the tribe has their own social services when it comes to the protection services. They do their own child welfare and adult protection. They don't do any eligibility services. We still do all eligibility services for everyone in the county, including the tribe. At the same time, I can't just go down to the tribe and collect on these guys. So they, they have a boundary of which I, I can't just be knocking on doors collecting money. And that, so I'm doing child support with one hand tied behind my back, essentially. And I, I'd have to break those cases out to tell you just how many cases those are. But collecting on those is almost impossible. Could you try to um, figure out percentage-wise, you know, might be which uh, percentage of tribal cases versus non-tribal cases? Is that 30 percent? I can try to break that information out for you. Something yeah. like that just to have sure, a... Sure, I can try to break that, that information out for you. Because that would make a difference you, but automatically that's, adding percentages too. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I, I guess that's my answer is I, I can make that look like whatever you want. If you want that CSTAT number to improve, I can prove well, it next month. Well, what I want is for the people <laughs> to get their money. I, well, I do too, right. That's exactly right. And I, I agree with you. And I want kids to get what's owed to them. Yeah. Um, it sounds like they're doing a good job. They're and I, and I think we're, job. I do think we're hammering away at it. It's just with only three staff, it's, they're, they're, they're doing what they can. Okay. The, the other question I had, and I don't know whether I talked to you some maybe about this before, but, uh, the timeliness of uh, the reports of initial responses to child neglect and abuse assessments yeah. is not where the state says you need to be anyway. Correct. Yep. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. So when a case comes in to us, it's evaluated. If it's assigned, it comes in as either an immediate response, a three-day response, or a five-day response, depending on its necessity. So I can tell you that on same day responses, we're at 100%. Um, if there's a bruise, if there's something along those lines, I can, we were at 100% on that. Where we get caught is if we have to do an investigation like with the police department, 
I can't control their paperwork piece. I can't. <coughs> uh, sometimes cases fall out because of the other agencies that we're working with that I, I can't control their timeliness. Um, sometimes my, my staff um, will knock on a door and the family's not there. They have to go back out a second time, knock on the door, the family's not there, go out until we, until we find them. And sometimes it takes us more than three days to find these guys. Um, so timeliness has to do with face-to-face -face meeting with the child within those three days. And when families know we're coming and they hide, sometimes it's hard to track them down in those three days. Um, so that's what that timeliness comes down to. Uh, it's something I meet with my staff with weekly. They know that that's incredibly important to me. Um, and so we, we had gotten our numbers as of six months ago. We were up where they needed to be. They have slipped. I understand that. I'm, I am aware of that. It's something I do talk to them about regularly. And I'm not trying to make an excuse for it, but it's it's just not always as easy to track these families down as it, as it looks like on a CSTAT report. Um, you know, if, if a family gets a report made on them and they bolt out of town, we may never find them. You know, in those cases fall out. That happens. Um, so... Okay. I, I hope that I, I'm, I'm not trying to make excuses yeah, for my staff, good. but that's kind of why some of those things fall out. So. Yeah, that's, my, that's my question. Well, so, that's okay. So the, the only other local thing I'll tell you is so the CCAP, the Child Care Assistance Program, went through a, an overhaul to a new payer source or a way of paying. Of course, it's now rolling out six weeks late, um, which is causing us to do a lot of manual billing. Um, so you'll see that cease that measure fall across the state because the state can't implement anything on time. So sorry, not to sound anti. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. We appreciate the updates. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have it here. Bonnie has sick kids, and we didn't want to miss. We didn't want her exposing them to other people. So. Um, what this is is, is uh, an enforcement letter on Lloyd's that um, the action won't be, um, the spring won't be done till in the spring. So that's what this has to do with. And I told her if there were any questions, we could wait, or if it was um, similar like it, the others have been, we can go ahead and sign it and have it taken care of so that she can take care of it in the spring. This is basically an enforcement letter authorizing them to go spray the property. And is this, where is this property located? It is. Uh, does it have it on there? Um, address right there. Um, 9755 mm -hmm. Road, County Road AA, County Road AA, County Road 10, County Road 10, so it's out in that northern and which, and she which told, Lloyd does it, does, um, does it have the name on there at the top? Um, I think it's also um, a little more complicated. It's I think it's in a divorce situation. So that also doesn't help. This one says on road BB. Well, that's what I was getting at. I was trying to find out if it, if it was oh, I got the one that, with the divorce complication. I was just trying to verify that. And she said she'd sent us pictures of this previously when she gave us the pictures of all the ones. Um, that is all that I know. I wished it. I th did the other ones have the names on them? Do you recall, Kim? I think the letter itself did, but mm -hmm. not the resolution. Okay. And it, it, like I said, it is also um, not something that has to be done in the next two weeks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to to hold off on it, we're, we can easily do that too. I think it's one of those five that she identified as if they were non-responsive, non, non Yeah, I think she held that one back because of the, because of the divorce situation. And I'll tell you too, I mean, we did in, do enforcement on four. Mm -hmm. Three have repaid those funds. Mm -hmm. So at this point, out of the four, there's probably only one that's going to go as a lien, as a tax, um, on the tax lien so far. So um, mm -hmm. we've sparked some, and a couple of them actually went and did 
instead of us doing the enforcement, they went and sprayed the stuff themselves. So I think I think there was one or two of those. So it's taking corrective actions. And all I know is the last name is Lloyd. I think it's a younger couple, but I don't I don't know. She just asking for her a letter. Uh, this a resolution, letter resolution so that so which that in authorizes in the spring for us to go the county pay somebody to go spray those weeds. <clears throat> I, 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 I would move that we approve resolution number 15 2017 uh, for the Montezuma County Weed Program or designates to enter property to control noxious weeds. Second. Motion and a second to approve resolution number 15 2017 for the purpose of right of entry to private property to control noxious weeds. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I just clarify that's noxious weed resolution 15? Oh, I'm the, sorry. the other. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we number them differently. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then that would bring us on our agenda to um, public comment. Somebody would like to comment. All right, um, seeing them, we will adjourn for lunch, and then it's we've added to the agenda. We're going to have a conversation, uh, a continuing conversation about our budget shortfall after lunch. More budget fun. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and for all for those that missed, we had a great uh, advisory uh, CSU advisory meeting today at seven. Um, a lot of good questions. And good, a good committee to work on our extension office and get some things changed. They asked some very tough questions and yeah. it was probably one of the very productive I guess I do have one thing. I have budget things that we'll talk about this afternoon, but this is almost a budget thing too. Um, make us. No, um, the town manager. Oh, no, the tower. Heather, Heather, Heather. Heather Alvarez has wanted to meet with you guys and see what kind of, um, I think they're needing financial support for DOLA grants and things like that to assist with um, putting a, some kind of tower on their water, on their water tower up there to, to help fiber with optics fiber optics, optics out there. Tower. So um, I just wanted to bring that up for you guys to consider, think, or it's also a budgeting issue. So um, that's something that she has requested and I haven't answered her yet. How about a letter of support? She, uh, she didn't specify an amount or anything no, like she, that. Not she? yet. She just wanted to suggest a meeting with you guys just to tell them what exactly they're trying to do so you could hear more about the project. Um, to decide if you wanted to, or if you were able to support. So I can put her on the agenda, or her and the mayor can come talk to you guys. Do you have a preference? When are we gonna do a breakfast again? Oh, uh, we're overdue. Mm -hmm. We're also overdue on town hall. We tried mm -hmm. and tried and tried to get a hold of Toyok. Yeah, nothing came. Um, we finally got a hold of someone that we left a message for, and they never returned a call. They'll call you tomorrow. Could I suggest that we get Tory Ark so far as the town hall and put it at uh, Battle Rock? Battle Rock? We could do that. Okay. It's just a suggestion if everybody. Okay. Yeah. What's going on down there? That would be a, uh, that'd be a good place. I'm guessing, um, I think we were supposed to have one in October. So do we want to set that for January? Why not? Why, why not December? You can't. Holidays. Everybody has holiday issues. Yeah. So. Yeah, but Christmas is uh, on the 25th. There's 31 days. A lot of company parties, a lot of programs, a lot of school stuff. Well, I mean, we can. But I think we want to set up where we have the best 
participation. Hopefully, best opportunity for participation. Yeah. If you want to pick a date, we'll see what we can do. What are we going to do on a Tuesday? We've done some on Monday, some on Tuesday. Well, we, to have enough time, you would about to have to be on the 19th, or it would have to be in January. What I'll contact the school. I will let you know. Okay. <coughs> you know, Larry Don, those don't do a really good when they're sitting on the table. I know, but I was looking how smashed they were. Oh, my God. Thank <laughs> you.